broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with G.I. Greg, as you know from before. What's up, fellas? It's been a couple of years, but here we are again. Um, and uh, bad news, Brandon. It's good to be here. Yeah. So we'll see how this works out. I'm going to pay a little homage to Liberty Larry. What you drinking on? <laughs> I have some brandy because I wanted to finish a bottle and make space in my liquor cabinet for something else. Um, but there was a little more in the bottle than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> His glass is like half full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be. It's a brandy glass, you know. It's supposed to oh, just yeah, have... No. I was surprised you showed up for the podcast ready for a party. Your suggestion was fantastic, by the way. Yeah? You mm -hmm. like the Clyde Mays? Mm -hmm. I shouldn't mention their names since they're not paying me, but... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Free country. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. sipping on that as well. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah, that's the nine-year rye. It's hard to find. Mm. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's an allocated product because I've only seen it once. And yeah, I've, uh, the only Clyde Mays I've seen has been... Uh, like their blue label stuff you can find anywhere. You need to be more on I got to be all up in that spot. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Don't uh, want a repeat of last time. Okay. So um, did you guys listen to the last podcast by any chance? I did not. I did not prepare, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, you didn't have to listen to the last podcast. To, I thought that I was bringing on fans, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been keeping up, just I guess not as closely as we probably should have. Well, I was talking to uh, I was talking to Greg about the Palestinian situation, um, and he gave a little harumph on the phone. I did. <laughs> so you don't I'm, want to touch that with a ten foot pole. Oh, okay. You want to stay away from it? No, right. I mean I I'm fine with it. I just don't know how I specifically feel. Okay. about it mm -hmm. but i'm okay with it well you don't have to take sides that's not that's not really the question i guess i don't think um, we should be any side I don't that's think. a yeah that's a good point and that's something that we've advocated I, what i tried to push on the last podcast is that um the it, it comes out of the free speech stuff and uh i figure i figure brandon might have some input on this too but um it comes out of the free speech stuff and, and the kind of shutting down of both sides of the debate, uh, particularly on college campuses, as far as I can tell. And it just being, well, okay. I guess this is the thing that really strikes me that I didn't say on the podcast, which was, is that this, the Israel issue is what makes uh, conservatives woke. Oh. That they like really go into the, um, identity politics and uh, you can't talk about that thing or those people in that way and everything's insulting and so on. And they're generally against that. But when it comes to Israel, you can't talk about anything about Israel because suddenly it's anti-Semitism and we're all trying to kill all the Jews. <laughs> yeah. You can't crit criticize them in any way. It's anti-Semitic. You can't, it's, it's frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating mm -hmm. uh, to see, um, uh, oftentimes I wake up in the morning and Fox News will be playing on the TV and it is frustrating to, like you say, have the threat to free speech, the threat to free speech be something like um, them portraying or framing a lot of the uh, people protesting on college campuses or voicing their opinions as a Oh, all of them are just, they're Hamas supporters or they're yeah. anti-Semites. Yes, exactly. They're genocidal mm -hmm. because they mm -hmm. are voicing their... Opposition <sighs> to a genocide. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I find it interesting. I, what I tried to stress on the podcast is that uh, criticism of a government does not mean criticism of the people. And so um, I support the uh, Palestinians... Um, I support Palestinian rights, the, uh, the movement for Palestinian rights, but I don't support Hamas and I'm critical of the Israeli government, but that doesn't make me an anti-Semite. Absolutely not. Because I'm critical of the U S government too. That's the com That's the conversation your mother and I were having was, uh, she, she had brought up when we dropped off your sister-in-law. She brought up the previous podcast, and that was the thing. She kind of was like, well, I'm, I'm not going to discuss that because it was I 
didn't agree with him. Mm -hmm. And she started to list off her points about, oh, Israel is like an ally and and this sort of thing. And I I was like nodding my head to the points that you were making that she was having issues with. And my Mm -hmm. whole thing was, I was like, no, I don't even think we should be there. Like it, it doesn't matter to me. It's not my, it's the whole, not my backyard, not my fight. Mm -hmm. We have caused more problems in other countries, our involvement. So why should we be involved in the first place? Like, and I don't know. I don't, I really don't know. I guess it, the way everyone is now, it's like, you have to pick a side. Mm. It's like, you have to either be for Israel or Hamas. I'm for America. I I don't want to be involved in it. Why? Why? I, I don't care. I certainly do, uh, sympathize and to an extent agree with the uh, isolationism mentality of how the U.S. should engage with a lot of foreign affairs like this. And this one specifically, I'm all for it because if you if you look towards... Uh, right. Pause, everybody. We're adjusting the mic. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> I can keep talking. Oh, it it doesn't bother me. Really <clears throat> there you go. That's probably, that'll probably be better. Okay, that's the end of our technical issues. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. I'm keeping an eye out, though. I'm trying to watch the, the levels here. But it's it's so frustrating that even with, like... That's iso- definitely better. It is okay. Yeah. yeah. Like, isolationism in this case would be a million times an improvement. Because as of right now, we are actively supporting and embedding a... A genocide. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of people take exception to that. I think that it's fair, at least, to say that this is a, an ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip. Absolutely. Um, so, if you if you take exception with the use of the term genocide, which I, actually I think in a lot of ways is appropriate here, but it's incredibly appropriate. I don't um, think there's another word to, to use for it. I but, mean, ethnic cleansing, tomato, tomato. Well, th- there is a difference there. Uh, you know, a genocide is actually wiping out the people. So I, I, I can see where you could argue against that. Um, I don't see how you can argue against the, the clear statements of the Israeli government that they would like to push all the Pen- Palestinians out of Gaza. That's an ethnic cleansing. It doesn't require killing everybody. It's just trying to get them out of that land. Um, and so at least that point I don't think is debatable. So I'm trying to stick with that. I, I understand. I understand. No. The, even though semantics can be frustrating in situations like this, clarity mm-hmm. is very important. Yeah. And, you know, just some words uh, trigger people in various ways. Like, I, I don't want to put people in a position where they just stop listening to me. So No, it's it's the, <laughs> the same idea behind, you know, like someone disagrees with you or says something slightly offensive so then you call them a nazi and the word loses all its meaning and you mm-hmm. lose your credibility yeah or call them an anti-semite mm-hmm. exactly <laughs> but very applicable in this situation yeah um well we got a cat yeah she's new people <laughs> <laughs> um oh i forgot what i was gonna say next oh well uh, it's this is probably going to be a fairly random podcast anyway. Oh, so I would prefer it to just be very uh, low key. I did not prepare probably as much as I'd like, but um, that's my fault. We drank too much. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I definitely would prefer us to, this just to be more the low day key. Has I'm just not begun. It's not I, even lunchtime. I wasn't trying to <laughs> come in here and like grill you about policy or anything like that. You know, this mm-hmm. is just us. You know, speaking about things that we think are important. Well, I, you do listen to the podcast pretty regularly, I think, right? Yeah, fairly regularly. Yeah, right. So what would you like to talk about? What would you like to not grill me, but challenge me on? Or, <laughs> so, uh, or, or what are what are the points that we that kind of run through the podcast that you uh, disagree with or or take exception to in one way or another. That might be a fun way of taking this Wow. Forward. Yeah, that's that's a neat thing to discuss because I know uh, I have very libertarian views, and I assumed him being my child would as well. But uh, he doesn't let on a lot of the times mm-hmm. about how he actually feels about things. So I'm interested to hear. Well, I was told coming into this podcast that capitalism specifically and the uh, like just the economic system that we live under would be a major point of like just the major topic of the podcast and 
how you... We don't plan very well here, really. But that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> uh, but uh, Greg told me specifically that you were curious about how um, younger people, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty young. I'm 23, almost 24 years old. Like, I'm definitely... <laughs> Yeah, that's half my age. Yeah, haven't been around very long, but uh, we're curious as to how the reasoning behind why a lot of young people have a lot of disdain for capitalism specifically. Yeah, and there you go. Tell me that. Lean towards um, other things like, uh, you know, obviously Bernie Sanders got very popular for his uh, being a paladin of socialism. Mm -hmm. Until and he turned out to be a cuck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Man, it's a. Uh, Is he wrong? Damn, <laughs> damn shame. He's absolutely not wrong. <laughs> Just let the DNC walk right all over him. Mm -hmm. um, no, uh, it's. Uh, but they'll they'll lean towards things like socialism or uh, it, communism on the more extreme side of things because there's a lot of um, uh, the. Just a lot of radicalism, honestly, on both yeah. sides. Is is there a real belief that socialism or communism would improve the lot of most people? Absolutely. There's a huge, um, there is a huge movement, I guess you could say, as of recently, as people who are disillusioned with the way life has treated them, with how the system has treated them, mm -hmm. and they want something different. So what happens is the more educated people will look into ideas of the past, socialism and communism, Marxism, like mm -hmm. overall being one of those. Uh, it's the, it's the joke that kind of comes around as like, you know, like every college kid reads the communist manifesto and they think that they found the Bible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and I understand that too. Like I used to advocate for a lot of those ideas as well um because i did the same thing you know i read the communist manifesto I'm pretty sure i was in high school when i read it but um and then i i you know i promoted marxist ideas for quite some time after that it, but there was a recognition like i recognized then that it required like a real change in ideology yeah. um like that i don't know like even a change in human nature and somewhere along the way, I determined that that wasn't a thing that could happen. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't reject Marxism on principle. You rejected it on its practicality. Um, I rejected it in the sense that it is uh, an, an completely unattainable ideal. Um, and, uh, and I rejected it on uh, the history as I learned more about that too. Because like, I was in high school... Uh, like I had just, well, no, I get maybe I was at the end of middle school when the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, cause that yeah, was like was 90, kid. right? Like I graduated in 95. So it was like end of middle school, early high school when the Soviet Union collapsed, collapsed. And we started to learn a lot more about what had been going on in that country up until then. Um, and then, you know, uh, the, uh, I guess I was exposed to what happened under Mao in China also. And, uh, yeah, it, it's just a, a system that it's a system that seems to me now, um, as I've had more time to reflect on it, that, uh, communism is a way of making everybody equally poor instead of unequally prosperous. Well, the, the, the what's the appeal? <laughs> That's the thing I don't understand to young people, like, what is the appeal of it? Is it just because it's something different? The appeal comes from a lot of uh, young people feel like uh, they're growing up with a boot on their throat. Um, a lot of young people, whether you, you could argue rightly or unjustified, um, are feel like they are being oppressed or forced into a system that advocates for <laughs> I, I suppose uh I, I think that the the constant critique that I see of capitalism is the 
lack of compassion inherent in it in which you can get into like the semantics of like whether or not an economic system should even account for something like empathy or compassion or if it should just be as <clears throat> as uh I guess, uh, what's the word for it? I, I guess you could say uh, sociopathic, as it possibly can be. Well, I, I would. this is how I'd respond to that. Um, I, I would say that uh, that the great insight of, of capitalism, of a free market, um, is that the best way to succeed is to provide something of value to somebody else. Uh, now leaving out the, the government portion of it, cause that's where I'm going to say the problem is, but I, I don't, I don't think that young people see that they see the big corporations as the problem instead of the government that props up those big corporations and creates the rules so that those corporations win and everybody else loses. But the, the free market system, um, is the, the best way certainly that we've seen where to incentivize a fiercely tribal species um, to benefit from providing to people that they don't know. Mm -hmm. Fiercely tribal, yes. Like, obviously, we are uh, inherently competitive by nature, mm -hmm. which is something that capitalism absolutely encourages. The, the problem inherent in that, which a lot of people my age like to point out, is, uh, like I said, like the, the, the not accounting for the empathy in that, uh, the flaws in free market capitalism come across in uh, the loosening of regulations. I know that you are a huge proponent on free market capitalism and just like, obviously, like anything goes the consumer will decide at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Every dollar you spend is a vote. Every dollar you spend is a vote. That, that mentality gets into a little bit of trouble when you account for, in the absence of regulation, monopolies that can form in the ever-expanding growth that capitalism demands. Well, okay. So let, let's follow that a little farther. Um, okay. What do you think is the destiny of a monopoly the, in a free market? The destiny of a monopoly in a free market. So you're talking about an already established monopoly. We can, already... we can take it to the monopoly and then beyond, or we can start where the monopoly already exists. I don't care. I can, okay. I can handle this either way. So <laughs> Okay, I got you. I got you. So uh, I think Microsoft is a pretty good example mm -hmm. as uh, some, like their operating system is head and shoulders like 99 something close to that percent of the market mm -hmm. uh there was a i know that there was a hearing that was called um i think it went to the supreme court i'm not quite sure uh to see if they were going to break up the company because of that and it did not go through Microsoft still has a monopoly over the leading operating system for computers, which is, I mean, in the modern era, computers dictate every part of most people's lives. Okay. How did they, how did they acquire that monopoly? What, what do they offer? I I'm, guess. I'm assuming that you would like to make the argument that they had the better product. Not they, necessarily. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. So what's the argument that you would make in like how they would get, how they got there? Um, well, I would say that, uh, that there's a couple of ways that they can get there in our system, um, which isn't a free market. No, no capitalist system. Um, now I, I think that it, it's fair to say if we're talking about in terms of a free market, that they offer the best product. Let's just take that argument. Um, that they offer the best product, and so everybody adopted their product, and now it's kind of entrenched itself. Uh, okay, I think you need to tighten that. <laughs> <laughs> You're breathing too hard. A little bit more technical <laughs> difficulties. Yeah, we'll, we'll work this out. Mm. Maybe should have gone with the lavaliers. Oh, well. Live and learn. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll know for next time. Um, so... Uh, 
I, I would say um, like a good historic example is um, was it Kodak? The um, camera company that dominated the market. And they didn't properly account for the future trends and they don't exist anymore. Um, I think uh, Microsoft, even if they had the best product available, um, Blackberry. Blackberry's a good one too, uh, except that probably nobody heard you say that. <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> um, the, their one bad Windows release away from failure without a uh, government intervention. I absolutely disagree with that. Okay. Um, you could argue that what should have killed Microsoft was Windows 8. Yeah. Windows 8 was, I know not one person who was happy with that release because it had a slew of problems, uh, not smallest among them being that it was an operating system designed chiefly for tablets mm -hmm. because... Microsoft, um, and all the little tiles and stuff. Of course, oh. of course. Yeah, it was Microsoft believed that at that time they thought that the market was shifting towards um, th things like the, the the Surface laptop, things mm -hmm. that were um, uh, hybrids of tablets and laptops. Things didn't really go that way. Uh, while yes, tablets are still very popular. A lot of people who are tech savvy, which that population is getting, is growing larger and larger every day, prefer either, excuse me, they prefer either desktops, which more and more people are learning how to build their own PCs every day and not mm -hmm. acting like that is the norm, or uh, very functional or powerful laptops. They did not accurately predict where the market was going to go with that. And because of that, they had quite a few complaints. A lot of people that I know, again, very allegory, but this is my experience. Anecdotal uh, then. Anecdotal. Sorry. Yeah. I used the wrong word there. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a word that I actually have a lot of trouble with. I really have had to focus to make sure that the word anecdotal is in my head because mm. it's the one that I, every time I want to use it, I'm like, you know, it starts with an A. It's like the opposite of empirical. Mm -hmm. Like I, I can never come up with the word, but I've gotten a lot better. <laughs> it comes up a lot in debates because mm -hmm. people like to use the whole like, oh, well, actually my mother's grandmother mm -hmm. uh, said so-and-so happened to her and this is why she yeah, believes Yeah, talk about XYZ. COVID with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a lot of people switched over to Mac. Mm -hmm. A lot of people switched over to Linux in that time. But what is that like 0.01 percentage of users because microsoft well they i mean they lost a lot of money too because people didn't buy eight they didn't yeah. they didn't upgrade to eight they a lot of people stuck with seven yeah um there's you know it there's a lot of opportunity for loss there and there were probably plenty of people that switched to another operating system that never came back to windows after that too mm -hmm. um now, they, they do have the advantage of being like the primary business. That's what I was getting at is yeah. that like, yes, there were people who switched. And in my anecdotal mm -hmm. uh, experience, there were people who switched to Linux or mm -hmm. uh, Mac, which I have my own personal issues with. But uh, most people just like, oh, man, this is weird. This sucks. But they don't know any different because mm -hmm. Microsoft has windows and windows is all most people have ever known most yeah. people aren't old enough to remember dos or uh, i still have a fuck, or a commodore and dos box and like <laughs> anyway um no there there's a I, actually i think more than windows what has really solidified them in the system is uh, office I, I think the microsoft office products are really what has them um so firmly in control of they're great, but Google is competing pretty heavily with that. With yeah. the the Google documents and their whole office suite is mm -hmm. really taking everything by storm. I know that at least when I was in school, that's what we used. I had Microsoft Word on my computer mm -hmm. and I would turn in, I turned in a couple of uh, written essays for that. And they're just like, no, you can't 
just give me the document. It's on a Google Doc. We're all part of the same uh, because it's all linked through accounts and you can mm -hmm. have different groups that you've That's created. That's more of an integration with the Microsoft Office products though, isn't it? It's no, not... it's not. It's its okay. own it's its own product. It's uh, a lot of it happens within the browser, so it's mm -hmm. not even a program you have to download. And with the Google Docs, it's become a lot more fulfilling and helpful for businesses specifically because it's integrated with your account. So you can have different groups that you have set up with. I know that that's what I do um, with my, my friends with our own personal pictures or email or videos that we'll share with each other. We will create something on Google Drive and then have all of our accounts linked to it, which you can get into the monopoly that Google has as well, but they do compete at least on that level. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually, I was thinking, uh, Microsoft office, their, their attempt to, uh, move their office suite into a web-based system, mm -hmm. I think is probably something that's going to cost them in the long run. Cause if you ever tried to print a document that's in the, the web-based system, have you ever tried to edit macros <laughs> inside of Excel on Google? Yeah. You can't do it. Yeah. I like even just printing a document that somebody sends you through the web-based system takes like six clicks, literally six clicks to go through and get it to a point where you can actually print to your printer. Um, where of course it's just like a little one click on the, the yep. uh, desktop based system. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that they have made things so inefficient that there's certainly room for, uh, for somebody to step in there. So, but here's the other side of the argument that I would make for, uh, the monopoly of something like Microsoft is that that monopoly exists primarily through, uh, legislation. Um, that they, uh, that they have such power that they, um, lobby for a specific legislation that raises the bar, raises the barrier to entry to any competitor. Um, that and and it's not even just like legislation within their own field. It's uh, legislation, labor legislation, and everything else too. Um, so if you look at uh, all the requirements that I suspect a lot of socialists and communists think are fantastic about uh, minimum wages and the requirement for health insurance and um, uh, whatever other benef benefits uh, exist, the uh, time off and what have you, um, that have gone through, that raises the cost for any competitor to enter the field because they have to pay for so much. An employee, just a single employee, costs so much more than their wage um, at this point that, uh, it, that it's hard to compete with an established firm that has money to spare. And so I would say that in a free market system, um, especially one that with, like if we stripped all of that away, that Microsoft's power would be tenuous at best. Because while they have the, while they're there now, um, one of the problems of a very large business like that is that they're not very agile. So as the market shifts, they have a hard time shifting with it. It takes more time. There's a lot more bureaucracy, a lot more people to um, move their, um, resources uh, to the appropriate things, whereas a smaller business can step in there and, and fill those needs very quickly. Um, but it's hard for a smaller business to step in there and fill those needs very quickly because the requirements placed upon them just to have a business is so high. So you made a good point there, uh, definitely about how regulations can stifle and stifle. Point for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they, they, they can exacerbate the problems that occur within capitalism. However, uh, the counter argument that I would make is, or not even a counter argument, just another point I'd like to bring up is what is your solution to um, humanitarian humanitarian or health concerns uh like i know donald trump under his legislation lifted a lot of different safety restrictions mm -hmm. and um regulations that they had with uh the railways specifically and at least in my mind as a direct result of that you had uh the crash that happened uh, down south there for a little while. And of course there was a lot of Midwest, right? I, I believe so. Yeah. There's Ohio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. 
I didn't and, want to say the state, but I knew Midwest. Yes, and it was um, the Ohio State. And of course, <laughs> obviously, uh, Biden didn't do anything noteworthy of that. I'm not a fan of him either. Mm-hmm. But uh, people were championing, "Oh, Trump actually went there and he showed up," even though the way that I see it, his his change in the legislation was a direct cause of that. And it's he is just as guilty as uh, our current president in perpetuating mm-hmm. a lot of the problems that specifically our railways have um, with because obviously we had that strike just a few months ago where they were basically advocating only for sick leave mm-hmm. and there we wouldn't budge on that at all yeah well uh, just a few years before they had raised their wages by a significant amount um, through uh, through striking as well, though. I mean, <laughs> I guess you can't have it all at some point. And while I, I support union, while I support private sector unions, I should be very specific about that. I do not support public sector unions at all um, because that's just um, uh, leveraging your tax money <laughs> for their benefit. But um, there, there is a drawback to that too. Like, uh, so unions can press for more and more and more, but if there are enough people that are willing to do the same work for less, then they've overplayed their hand. That's part of the deal. Um, now, in terms of the specific legislation, I don't know enough about it to comment on about whether you know Trump was a, a direct cause of this. I do know that the um, the number of railway accidents is higher than anybody generally realizes and has been pretty consistent for a while. Um, the, other par- uh, the other point that I would make on that is that um, rail is the, the most inexpensive form of transport of goods. And so if you want to start complaining about um, the rise, at, like price inflation, then getting rid of railways or putting more um, legislation on that is just going to raise those costs even more. Now, that's not to excuse any of this either. Um, but there are I- inherent risks with any kind of transportation of mo- or movement of goods. That's true. And like that, I, the only reason I bring it up is where, at least in my mind, uh, regulations like that can be very helpful is mm-hmm. at least in, in, in terms of safety, because a corporation or a business um, has no incentive to take into account human life in any way. It, it's more so just like, what does the consumer need and well, helping fulfill I, their need? I think that you just contradicted your own argument there. You think so? Yeah, I do. Okay. Because just in their concern for consumer needs is a consideration of human life yep. and needs. But wouldn't you say that there is a barrier between worker and consumer there, at least in that argument? Explain. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not trying to put you on the no, spot. No, no, no. I, just... I got you. I got you. I got you. Um, so the, the reason that I bring that up is because the... Speak a little more into the mic, though, too. <laughs> like, point, <laughs> point at it. That's, <laughs> that's all my point. Yeah. The argument that a lot of people, especially my age, have against the capitalist system is that a lot of corporations seem to be uh, very callous or like sociopathic is the word that I get seen get thrown around a lot because it is it's not a person. It's not a person. It's not a feeling thing. It's just a, uh, a I mean, a collection of people, but that becomes more than that becomes a system. Um, I personally believe that having certain like reasonable, because obviously every, every situation is going to have nuance. Every situation is going to have specifics that need to be kept in mind. Certain regulations in that way that might impede the idealist, vision of what a free market capitalist society can be are important? Well, I, I think... Now, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, however, I would say that if you 
if you dig in, um, if you look at the regulations that exist that uh, limits a free market in various ways, I think that you'd find a lot more regulation that actually protects the corporations than makes them more liable. Um, and in terms of the answer to the, the question about, you know, how do you protect people outside of legislation, um, I would say liability is the answer. That if somebody is harmed by the actions of a business, rather than protecting the business, making them liable for damages is the way to, to answer that problem. And that can be done in a free market system without interference by the government. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, now, the unfortunate thing is the government controls the the whole court system as well. Of but, course. Um, it, but I mean, but there are answers outside of that. I mean, there's a lot more moves, especially if you're looking at businesses um, these days that that are moving to the. Uh, uh, oh gosh, what's the system called? Um, where you have independent judges, and um, um, I, I advocate this all the time. I'm not familiar. Uh, Anyway, use working outside of the the um, the government court system no, to I, settle disputes. I Arbitration. Abs- that's what I was yes, going for. Arbitration. I, I absolutely agree that a court system divorced from at, at some at some level from uh, the current governmental or legal system that we have is important because that I mean that's where you get the issues with uh, that's where you get the issues with. Uh, you know, police reform Mm -hmm. that people have been advocating for for decades, but we haven't seen a sliver of because they are in charge of holding themselves accountable. So, you know, a a police officer can just shoot and kill someone and then receive no repercussions. Yeah, because it's the same people that create the laws, interpret the laws, and enforce the laws. Of course. They all work for the same person. Um. I got a cat just like staring at me, waiting for <laughs> being needy. <laughs> hey, buddy, how are you? Um, to go back to the monopoly thing, I, I would say like you know some historical examples you have are like the Vanderbilts, right? Um, so they dominated steamboat travel for quite some time, and one of the big arguments that you hear all the time is that you know whenever a competitor entered the field, they would just drop their prices. Um, and then, and it would push the competitor out. But of course, in the meantime, they're losing money, right? Like you can only sustain this for a certain period of time. And if you have enough competitors enter, you can't maintain that long enough to keep all your competitors out. Uh, Mm -hmm. Of course, Vanderbilt then lobbied government for support and, you know, um, I, I would say that the only way that a monopoly maintains its monopoly is with government help, um, and that the the most uh, the majority of monopolies in this country are government monopolies, and and that's exactly what what communism is hoping for. Like, all right, well, we'll let the government control all of these industries. So then, all you have is monopolies, and like that's an answer to the problem in some way, which. To me, it seems clearly not to be. <laughs> yeah, even though that's obviously there's a, there's a line between communism and socialism. There's a line between all of these different ideologies and, and getting, especially. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you right here because I, I see you're on a roll. I'm I'm gonna make a suggestion about how we can arrange the mic to maybe make this work a little yeah, bit we're, better. Yeah, we're, we're struggling a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would say move it more my direction, but have it pointing kind of in that way, so that Brandon, as you're looking at me, you're you're talking into the mic. Um, and then since Greg seems to be the quiet one on the podcast now, Oh, I'm just enjoying, this is like <laughs> two of the smartest people I know. I love watching you guys talk. Like I'll, I'll give little inputs here and there, but it's yeah. just, it's fun for me. Well, if it's there now, you can kind of lean in when you have something to say instead yeah, of I saying can, it way off axis and nobody hearing what you have to Yeah. Say. And I can talk into it from this angle and not worry so much about how I'm yeah. looking at you when I talk to you. Yeah. Your levels are good right there. So, okay, good. Um, so to kind yeah, of Yeah, I interrupted to, you. No, you're, you're, you're like perfectly fine. Too. Uh so you specifically mentioned communism and I think that it's important to make that distinction between communism and socialism and mm-hmm. how like, you know, the practices come about. Can you explain that for people? Yeah. 
Oh yeah. Uh, so find um, the difference. So the definition of both of them gets very murky because the definition of both of them has been interpreted in various different ways by various different governments and various different political political leaders. Uh, the USSR interpreted it very, I guess you could say, uh, generously, um, because communism that, specifically here, because they were yes, communism specifically when they yeah. when they interpreted. Actually, I think that was an outside. I mean, I, they they called themselves the Union of Socialist, you know, Soviet Socialist Republics. Everybody and, outside yeah. called them like that. That was the American propaganda was that it was communist. And Nazi was also an acronym for you know mm-hmm. the national, national socialist. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, it's even though Hitler was more or less a dictator. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that was more of a socialist movement than um, Italy was your real fascist regime at that time. I mean, when I mean getting into that, they're still very much different flavors of fascist. It's just, oh no, I agree. Yeah. I think they're two sides of the same coin. It's just a matter of what you call the people with power. Sure. Um, I, I mean, the the fascist system. Uh, still says that it's private ownership of all the businesses, but the government controls it. And in the um, communist or socialist system, uh, they don't call them private. They call them government owned. But the government still controls it. Like it, mm. it, it really doesn't. In, in both systems, the government controls business. But in one of them, it's private ownership, supposedly, even though they don't have any real control. Yeah. And like, I will go ahead and admit the inherent flaws in socialism specifically in that way, <clears throat> because you look at, um, even though lots of people interpret them very differently, uh, communism, socialism, socialism specifically, if you're going to look at the two core tenets of it, you have the workers, uh, democratically, um, owning or dictating the means of production. And then you have um, a democratic uh, means to enforce uh, workers' health and safety. So things like unions and things like mm-hmm. that. Like Because we have, even though we are predominantly capitalist, we still do have socialist policies within that system. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I don't know that we're predominantly capitalist anymore. You wouldn't think so? <laughs> no. <laughs> you gotta you gotta lean because in other, there, Greg, when you have comments. Bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because other other people would So I have a lot of uh Canadian friends. Mm-hmm. And of course, obviously, Canada, very different mindset, very different view on the US. Uh the way that almost all of them have seen it is they're like, oh, you guys don't actually have a socialist party down there. You have Republican and you have Republican light is the way that they would see it, mm. which I I understand where that comes from, because yeah. both in the if you're looking at the actual political parties, it's just various shades of um, different political pundits it's varying degrees of the same opinion yeah really. pushing the, their um, paladins of the status quo is mm-hmm. what they are mm-hmm. i believe it's called demagoguery <laughs> <laughs> i um so i i uh, agree to a degree uh there there's not a lot of difference between the two major parties. It's it's really a way of dividing the people so that they're fighting with each other instead of fighting with the people the oligarchy that they should be fighting. Of course, with, right? I agree completely. Um, the but I, I think that the whole system has moved left over the years. I uh, and I would use Donald Trump as an example of that. Like Donald Trump is saying the same things now that he was saying in the eighties. Like he really is. He's saying the same things now that he was saying in the eighties. But in the eighties. He was a Democrat. Yeah, registered Democrat. Yeah. And now he's the like the Republican somehow or another. Um, and so I, I think the whole system has moved has moved to the left. And it may be it, it may not be as left as like all right. So the, the last girl I dated off, was offered a job next year in Vancouver. And when we were talking about like where we might move next year, like I took that off the table. I was like, I, I like, I would love to visit Vancouver. I don't want to live in Canada. Um, it, and it's because it, like, Canada has moved much farther left. And you know, I was in Europe recently, and and while 
Switzerland was fairly conservative, I think, by modern standards in the sense that it's like a very federalist system and, and so forth. Um, like most of the area around that is much farther left than any party in the U.S. It's mandatory military service in Switzerland, isn't it? Or am uh, I wrong? Yeah, there's like a militia system that they, yeah. uh, you know, uh, similar, I think, to um, Israel. Okay. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't know completely how that works. No, I, I, I gotcha. Didn't, I, gotcha. I didn't really ask about that. I wasn't trying to be a citizen, so I didn't, you know, really question <laughs> that. Um, the thing that I liked was the uh, mandatory quiet time on Sundays. I just thought that was great. Like, I'm opposed <laughs> to the legislation to, to, to support that, but it was really nice to, like, just walk out there on a Sunday in the middle of a big city in Switzerland and it just be quiet. <laughs> Ah, uh, oh well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I guess, I guess the argument that I would make for that is Donald Trump was very much a, uh, for better or for worse, I guess you could consider him a maverick. He completely upturned the Republican Party as it stood. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, like, you don't got a lot of neocons left. Oh, yes, you do. You think so? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, they've just moved back towards the Democrats, where they started. Oh, okay. Um, they, they haven't gone anywhere. They've just switched parties again. So the neocons used to be Democrats, um, and then they found a better uh, support group, I guess you would say, in the Republican Party for many years. Um, Donald Trump made it okay to be anti-war and Republican, which... I think is his greatest achievement, honestly. Yeah. Um, that that this is a guy who stood there in South Carolina and said that they lied you into these wars and that we're we need to bring the troops home and so forth and and you know completely flipped the way the Republican Party had gone for years. And I think that a lot of those neocons, the Bill Crystals and the uh, Wolfowitzes and the, like all all these guys, they just kind of moved. They moved into an anti-Trump uh, situation and back towards the Democrat Party. They didn't go anywhere. They just kind of switched again. They they found their new support group again. And I understand, like I get it. Like I understand where a lot of that Trump support came from. And, that's what, he is and a, those guys are supporting Nikki Haley now too for the Republican nomination. That's gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but she is the the. They would say establishment Republican, which is the the Republican elite, which is still fairly neo -con. paladins of the status quo. Yeah, um, it, it's not the grassroots anymore. Obviously, I mean, Donald Trump is running away with the the numbers in terms of support. And He's got a cult of personality. You can't beat that's that. That's true. Um, and I used to like. There's there's upsides and downsides to that. I used to say th the same thing about uh, Ron Paul. Um, that, that a lot of, like, I, I just kind of resented the cult of personality around Ron yeah, Paul. His didn't get anywhere near as Donald Trump is probably oh, no, one of the, no, no. one of the, the kind of support that Donald Trump, one has. of the, the greatest, I don't mean in like a positive way, but just in an, an immense way the one of the greatest uh, cults of personality our country has ever seen, at mm -hmm. least in terms of a president. He's uh, he has an incredible ability of self promotion, um, and like it's it's. <laughs> I don't think that he's really that smart. Um, Absolutely, I not. don't think that he's <laughs> stupid either, though. I mean, like he's he has achieved quite a bit. The guy's not an idiot. Um, I think but his chief insight is that self-promotion, is that ability to get people to want what he is offering. I think um, his specific brand of narcissism is magnif magnetizing for a lot of people. Yeah. And he's certainly not the only narcissist in politics, that's for Absolutely sure. Absolutely not. I'm not. I'm not saying that like <laughs> he's special, but I... This is the thing that I, that I get into with people a lot about Donald Trump, because... Um, I guess it's really on the left uh, that I deal with this the most, is that I refuse to say that Donald Trump is some kind of unique evil because I don't believe that Donald Trump is some kind of unique evil. And this 
puts me on the outs with a whole lot of leftists. This guy is somehow special in some way. I'm like, okay, honestly, I think that he's less of a problem because he's very open about what he is, <laughs> you know? Um, like, I don't think that he's any worse than uh, a Barack Obama or George W. Bush or Joe Biden or whatever. I don't think he's any worse than any of them. But he's very, it's very clear what he is, and that's the difference. And that's really the only difference, as, as far as I can tell, is that he doesn't hide that he's just a terrible person. <laughs> right? And they're all terrible people, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't put it under some kind of shroud like the rest of them do. And that kind doesn't of... hide behind some kind of, um, you know, personality that, that people think is somehow um, elite or, uh, you know, ar aristocratic or whatever. Yeah. And that kind of bravado can be magnetizing for a lot of people. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why he... <clears throat> that's the reason why he got as big as he did, I believe, is because, like you were saying, he was willing to call out the current Republican legislation of the time. That's what's supposed and, to be in a brandy glass, by the way. Oh, <laughs> now that I'm like two thirds of the yeah, way through say, with yeah, my drink, his, yeah. not his two glass thirds. I think like I'd say th now half full when before it was like three quarters full. <laughs> no it's about like i think you're about three fourths of the way through what you started with that's yeah very impressive <laughs> well thank you <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're talking to the 23 year old here you know, all you got to do is drink some alcohol in front of me and i'm impressed <laughs> good to know <laughs> i would that's say for my for future pickups right like that future <laughs> oh, why are you Jesus. going at dawn? you don't need to do that Mike. Stay away from <laughs> nothing but trouble um so listening to you guys talk is awesome. The thing I interject right now is just um, thinking of Donald Trump. He was able, that cult of personality, to pull dumb guys like me, um, my brethren, you know, your blue-collar guys that want to say things that everyone tells them you can't say. You're not allowed to. Like, you're, you're right. Like, his honesty, mm -hmm. his ability to be that open and say the things that... Also <laughs> honesty is such a weird term to apply to him. Well, but there's, I know. There, like, no, there's a part of it, a, a part of that that's that's true, though. He's a disgusting like, human being, but... Well, there's an there's an honesty and there's a, a liar. Like, there's, there's both sides of that in Donald Trump. Like, there's the part of him that exaggerates everything to an extreme, and there's the part of it that just, like, says the quiet part out loud in front of everybody all the time. Yep. But it's because he, he can't hide it. He, he can't hide who he is, no matter mm -hmm. how much he helps himself, and he doesn't want to. Right, well, and that's and what we appreciate. What, yeah, it's not even just who he is. It's, like, some of the things that the government has done over the years. Like, they lied you into war in Iraq and mm -hmm. Afghanistan. They, the, yeah. Like, there's the, oh, we're only in Syria for the oil. Like, there's yeah. the, the other part of that that is just, like, it's not even really about him. It's about what our government does that he's not able to and hide. I understand why that appeals to people that he's willing to call out all of those problems with, you know, the, the current Republican or Democrat or just the, the current government le legislation. Mm -hmm. The problem inherent in Donald Trump is that he is very critical of all of those things, but he is more than willing to commit all of the same sins himself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And he's completely incapable of governing in any way that actually limits the ones that he's complaining about. Um, he doesn't understand the system enough. He's used to uh, an environment where he's able to come in there and say, this is how it's going to be, and everybody just kind of executes. And he doesn't know how to bring those kind of people into an administration. And I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not even sure that if he was capable of doing that, that that, was a, that would be a good thing. Mm. I mean, I think it would be in some situations, but not others. Uh, I, like, I was, the worst thing that he, the two worst things that he did while he was president was exit the JCPOA. That is a, an agreement with Iran that made the world a safer place. Mostly for the Middle East, honestly, because it took away the excuse of going to war with Iran. Um, and then the trade war with China. Like, that's just, it's almost unforgivable because of what it does to the people that like him the most. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the trade war with China just raised prices on all the essentials of life that we get from China. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't produce things. That's where we get it from. It's from them. It was the dumbest idea ever. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can also get into... Uh, I mean, Yemen's the big one that you can get into well, with him as well. Well, but that started with Obama. Obama started that war in 2013. That's true. That's um, and Obama started that war in 2013 to placate the Saudis over the JCPOA. I mean, that was a direct result of the JCPOA, which is, I think is actually probably the best thing that Obama did while in office. Um, but the result, one of the results of the JCPOA is in order to placate the Saudis, he supported their war against the Yemeni Houthis. And I, actually, I was at Mom's house and, um, and Fox News was on not that long ago. And they were talking about the, uh, the Yemen war, which I remember at one point not... It doesn't even seem like that long ago where I was talking to mom about the Yemen war and saying that it was the worst humanitarian crisis that existed at this time. And she was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) 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 Um, But now they're talking about it. It's only been going on for a decade. Uh, And uh, they, the, they were saying on Fox news, that the Yemeni while they're, they're attacking um, ships heading towards Israel. That's the, the new big thing. And they were saying that, well, they're using Russian weapons. I'm pretty sure it was Russian. It might have been Iranian, but I'm pretty sure they said Russian weapons. They're using Russian weapons to attack these ships. And I thought, are you sure it's not American weapons? Because a little over 10 years ago, we were on the side of the Houthis. We were supporting the Houthis in their fight against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And then we switched sides in that war to placate the Saudis. And so then we were supporting AQAP against the Houthis instead. But before then, we'd been giving a lot of weapons to the Houthis. So how do we know that they're not using American weapons to fight, to, I mean, to attack these uh, ships going into Israel? That's a pretty good rule of thumb. If you're fighting people in the Middle East who have any sort of organized weaponry, it probably came from us. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and this is what we support as a whole, actually, is just like chaos. The military-industrial complex. Well, uh, the United States government. I I mean, we support chaos throughout the world um, because we are the biggest weapons dealer in the world. Yep. By far. Um, And they're, you know, those guys get up in, in Congress and they say, hey, we need to support the Ukrainians. We need to support the Israelis because we're giving big contracts to weapons manufacturers in the U.S., And this is improving the U.S. economy. No, they're stealing that money from you to give to a specific group of people. It's not improving the U.S. economy. It's taking a bunch of money out of the U.S. economy as a whole and putting it into a government program. That's really what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, And people don't seem to understand that. Like, oh, sure, there's some people that benefit. These weapons contractors benefit. Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, like, they're making tons of money. And probably their executives, well, they're definitely their executives are making tons of money. And probably a lot of their employees are making good money too. But everybody else in America is paying that price, not receiving benefits from it. And and nobody seems to understand. And it, it, it goes back to the Bastiat principle of the seen and the unseen. So you can see these groups of Americans that are making a lot of money off of this. But you don't see all the Americans that are suffering because of it, that are losing because of it. Because all of that money that's going into those systems isn't going into other systems that could benefit all of us. Yeah, but those are the same dumb people that vote for the same thing over and over and over and over again because they're promised by these people that it's, <laughs> it's oh, I'm, I'm here for hope and change. It's going to be different. It's something new now. Yeah. It really was same shit different day with the um whether you're talking about trump or obama because you you mentioned that the yemen crisis started with him and uh, or bush because okay. you could actually draw a lot of parallels between bush and trump specifically in their you uh, can draw a lot of parallels <laughs> between bush and obama too yes you could um but i, I mean i i try to be non-partisan in this in in this kind of approach because like Bush started some major wars, mm-hmm. and uh, Obama started a whole bunch of minor ones. Do you mean Cheney started a bunch of wars, or did you mean <laughs> well <laughs> tomato tomato? It's hard to say, really. <laughs> I think that yeah, it was probably Cheney. I don't know that Bush was really smart enough to understand what was going on. That's my favorite quote: "Is uh, 
there's a saying in Texas. It's got to be in Tennessee too, where uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Well, you just ain't gonna fool me twice. (laughs) Yeah, that's. But that's kind of what I was. Why I brought up uh, the comparison. Fool me twice, I'll shoot you. (laughs) (laughs) That's uh, why I brought up the comparison between Bush and Trump specifically, is because I think they both have a very specific way of speaking to I mean I guess like the average American yeah like and I or can't the average person I can't general, mince words with it dumb people they have a very good way of speaking to I I think that that's uh I don't think that that's actually correct you don't think so no I I don't um okay because both of those people spoke to my mom my mom is absolutely yeah, she's brilliant. not dumb she's not dumb okay <laughs> Um, there's, I I don't know, there's like, uh, an understanding or maybe there's just a difference in, so I hear people, I'm I'm jumping all over, I've had enough of this brandy now that it's starting to affect me. Um, there's, uh, a part of, so I've heard over and over again that people in the South just don't understand. Why can't they vote for their own self-interest? People in the South are poor, and if they voted for Democrats, they would get, you know, what they needed to survive, blah, blah, blah. You know, these kinds of arguments. Um, and I, I, I've always said that the, the thing is that the people in the South recognize that anytime somebody's giving them something, they're creating an obligation. That there is a real um, understanding of and appreciation for um, being self-reliant, down here in the mm-hmm. south and um and so yeah so as as you accept favors from others you're actually creating an obligation and i, I think that people like trump less so george bush but particularly trump were able to tap into that idea that like i've been working hard i've been doing what i was told that i was supposed to do and it is not working for me and it's not working for me because there's these guys up in what because of the swamp, right? Because mm-hmm. there's these guys up in Washington that are working against your interests, and they don't care about you. They're just interested in what they can get out of you. And there's a lot of truth in that. I and I um, specifically in terms of Bush, I do think that he um, he was a great speaker in his own way. I think. Yeah. Um, I think that he did a very good job of. He made you feel like he Art. was one of you. Yes, and that's yeah. that's kind of what I mean. I, I I say dumb people, and I I maybe I should pull a little bit back from that because I know, I realize that there's a, a sense of elitism that comes from me saying something like that. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't gonna point that out. Directly. No, no, I was gonna. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, he gave me a raise every year I was in the Marine Corps, so I voted for him. Mm-hmm. George Bush. <laughs> Specifically, had a very. Did you vote for uh, Ron Paul? Uh, when would that have been possible? Which year? Uh, two thousand eight, two thousand twelve. No, I I did not. I don't think I was like full libertarian at that point. Okay. Um. I, okay. Okay. So that actually, like, we're I'm gonna derail this conversation again. Um, that actually kind of prompts another question. Like, what, what? brought you into libertarianism. I think we actually talked about this before, but we've got a lot of new listeners, so let's let's so, see this again. So the thing for me was um, I grew up, I'm half Native American. Uh, my family told me to vote Democrat because blue cares about you. Uh, they're <laughs> the ones that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now being older and understanding that like, yeah, I don't need that. I don't need handouts. Um And that the handout, like you were saying, comes with something associated with it. I, I did. So I did do that when I was young and then I joined the Marine Corps. And when I was in the Marine Corps, I realized, uh, okay, I'm going to go with red because that's what backs me. I'm, I'm in, I'm Marine. This is what I'm supposed to do. I, I got benefits from it because of Bush. And then I got out of the military and I kind of, I started listening to NPR 
honestly, before NPR was NPR that it is now. Oh, it's always been NPR. I, I that get it that, is right? Now, but really. so it was, it was, it was kind of that thing, like listening to them speak and realizing that uh, they used to be a little more even handed. Yeah, it, it was, and that. it was like okay, so they were discussing things like abortion and and uh, you know, uh, I don't know, premarital sex, uh, drug use, all these different small things that like I don't care. Like, it's your life, right? And so mm -hmm. I started to, like, it caused me to do research on, like, I literally typed in, like, which political party, you know, uh, believes in Second Amendment rights? Which political party believes in this? And I just kept seeing, like, this this weird word I'd never did seen before. Did you do, um, the, uh, like, I side with or whatever I that? I did, that, yeah. Okay. I'm a huge fan of that. <laughs> All um, right. I, I, if you dig really deep into it, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it'll give you some direction. Yeah, it, I, it's a good Cliff's Notes. I, if you've mm -hmm. never done it, you should go to isidewith.com. Uh, not a plug. Just it's it's nice to see. I think more people. So anyway, yeah, uh, long story short, I went into this thing where like I tried to decide for myself because it's like I want to be educated on my own. I want to know what's going on. And I realized uh, I, I side with Republicans on some things. And I side with Democrats on others. And it was like the one political party that I agreed with was, you know, wh what do they say? How, how does the saying go for libertarians as far as like uh, we're socially liberal and fiscally conservative? I know oh, that's that's yeah, a terrible. I, that, I know but... it is. Right. The <laughs> okay. one thing I do like about libertarians is that we can all say if you get a room full of us together, we don't agree on anything. Yeah. More freedom, less government. Uh, that's the that's one probably, that I really yeah, like. 100 yeah. percent. And so. For me, listening to you guys talk has been fun. One of the things I thought about, like, whilst you were both talking to, was uh, Brandon, I don't think you've realized it yet, and that's fine, was that, like, the entire conversation that you guys were having about, like, uh, uh, Microsoft Office and all these other companies, and you're aware of it, and I could see you thinking it is, like, government. The response to everything was government. Mm -hmm. government this was actually the focus of um so i did a, a keynote at our uh, county affiliate for the libertarian party of alabama and that was actually the focus of it is that we um what we've got to do is focus on the next step because people always stop short of government oh it's the 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 uh corporation's fault for blah 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 but generally speaking this isn't always true, but almost always true is that, yeah, the corporation is doing that because of some government legislation. There is some government mandate or legislation or requirement or whatever that makes it so makes it that regulates them in such a way that they kind of have to do this particular well, thing. I deal with OSHA every single day because I work in oil and gas. So mm -hmm. yeah, OSHA dictates every little thing that I do in my life, the regulations. And some of them, it's like, it's like they regulate out common sense. <laughs> they really do. It's like, you, the idea is to go to the lowest common denominator. That's, we should have a t-shirt that says government regulating out common sense. <laughs> that would be perfect. Larissa, if you're listening, go ahead and create that t-shirt. That would be awesome. Or Jerry, you, you got a cricket too. Yep. <laughs> I mean, this is the thing is that for the, the, the people that I, I think the younger people that think that the, um, that corporations are dictating everything, there's some truth to that. Like yeah. money goes a long way and the corporations with a lot of money can dictate a lot of things to the government. And the new example that I'm using a lot is Disney. Like Disney has a ton of money. Yeah, in and terms of media, they their umbrella reaches far and wide. I think a lot more than a lot of people realize is that they they are they own most ABC. Remember that they own ABC. <laughs> <laughs> they own like the television or Alabama beverage. No, no, no. <laughs> Probably no the television. Oh, okay. Um, that oh, okay. So yeah, this is an important point is that um, Disney has a broad reach and they have a lot of influence. Yes. But when it comes to the corporation 
opposed to the government, the government wins. In Florida, when they were opposed to DeSantis, oh, that's right. The government came out on top. So this is the thing. While while absolutely corporations have a tremendous amount of influence over government, when they when they're at odds, government wins. Government is the one with the real power, not corporations. Corporations have a, a strong influence. They can influence the government in various ways. But whenever they come to, to blows, government wins. Government is the real power. And government is the one that you really have to fight against. You don't... I, and I completely agree with you in the sense that they should be held to the highest standard. You can't say completely. Sense. I agree that they should be <laughs> held to the highest standard for that reason. Um, do you, I, I, rem, I remember having a conversation with you, maybe it was about a year ago, where you did not believe, uh, we were talking about media. We were talking about mm -hmm. uh, the cyberpunk because that new TV show had just come out. Uh, oh, and, yeah, yeah. And, and you were talking about... I don't remember. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember whatever. either. But they, you're, you're talking about how you didn't believe that a future like that was feasible where... Mm, where the, governments controlled everything, right? The, yeah. were, were, were the corporation and the government, like the, the power dynamic would mm -hmm. shift. Where the corporation was actually the one in control. Yes. Right. Okay. And um, because like there, there is people who would make the argument where it's like, oh, I'm sure that someone like Jeff Bezos absolutely believes he has more powerful power than the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Until they come for his taxes. I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> no, continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to distract you. I apologize. I didn't mean to disrupt your brain thought. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, moving on from there, uh, about what are we looking at on time? Who cares? Keep talking. Oh, yeah. We're like, we're, this is a long podcast. It's fine. <laughs> this has always been my, Michael, so this has always been my anger with you, is that um, sometimes I want to listen to you talk for like two hours, three hours, like this 51 minute stuff. Knock it, <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> I get so frustrated when we go over an hour. But Dude, it's we're a like teaser. An hour hour and 15 minutes we're having a good time already. pour yourself another glass now at, well oh, i should way, but somebody else empty. has to fill the time and i usually can't rely on liberty larry to fill the time <laughs> if i'm like hey man i gotta go uh pour another drink like you talk I he'll, can, he'll like come out into the kitchen and be like i don't know i haven't had anything to say <laughs> We're just crapping on him now. Sorry. Sorry, Larry. You do solid he work. He knows. I don't know. I he think knows. I think he's a great addition to the podcast. I like his contributions. Oh, I do too. That's why he's still part of the podcast. You know, like that's, <laughs> It's not like I can't find somebody else to talk. I, I appreciate what Liberty Larry does, but if you, if you put him on the spot, he's not real good. <laughs> If you just let him, like if I if I reach over for my drink and he's sitting there, he'll talk. Oh. But if I'm like, hey, talk for two minutes while I go pour another drink, then he's just like, uh. So I I have I have a <laughs> suggestion that I can alleviate this problem. Uh -huh. uh, did you want the same thing again? No, there, it's all gone. That's why. Uh, oh, okay. That's, so what <laughs> the would whole you, point was to pour all the brandy into you. the glass. Which, by the way, was like, uh, I don't know, uh, 320 milliliters. I don't speak uh, oh, I surrender. Don't... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I like imperial measurements. Oh my imperial god! Imperial <laughs> measurements that are based in nothing and make no sense. No, they're they're based on the length of uh, the <laughs> king's various <laughs> the oh, digits. Yes, yeah, some king thanks. from forever ago. No, but so what? What do foot. you want? What do I want? Yeah, um, because I will. See, I, I will peek, I, I will like, peek I a question. Go, uh, okay, so you'll pose a question to me and then go pour me a drink. I'm going to make you guys fight each other. That's what I'm. I'm going to instigate. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Well, then you got to come up with that, and then. You know, I'm kind of good with whatever is out there, man. Okay. I, like, I want whiskey now. I'm like, I'm done with the brandy. I want whiskey now. I got you. So I got you. whatever whiskey like really hard strikes stuff. you is fine with me. I like kind of hope that you tell me what it is when you put it down. Mm. But it doesn't really matter. I you can, feeling like, peppery or are you feeling sweet? Oh, I, I no, I like the man. I'm always on the high rye. 
plan, really. Yeah, you man after my own heart. Yeah, you guys advanced quickly. <laughs> um, so the question that I will pose. I to, don't want it in this class. Though. No, I know. I understand. That's the wrong okay. class. Um, to both of you. So if <laughs> he just can't figure out what he wants to do, look at him. I'm not talking about Greg now. Actually, the I'm cat. talking about a cat. Yeah. Uh, the evil <laughs> demon black cat. Um, so Brandon and he's named after a god that protected people's households. Which god? Bisu. Dude, I would. I could kick that thing so far. <laughs> I don't know that he'd put up with that. One. He's awesome. It's too. All, one. It's all it would take. One. He'd be done. He's he's the he's get a, the awesomest. Get a cat. dog. Yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm a, a dumb a dog guy. Is she around? What's your question, Greg? Ah, so yeah. question question <laughs> is right. Um. So if capital it is, capitalism is not the answer, um, and you think socialism is, or you don't? I do not consider myself a socialist. I am, I am receptive to a lot of the concerns people have over capitalism, especially people my age, people I talk to on a regular basis. Uh, because it's absolutely like you can't make the argument that it's a perfect system. Well, I, I would say that the a lot of the problems come to cronyism, which is like it's certainly an aspect of capitalism because government exists. But cronyism is really the problem, not a real free market voluntarist capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point I was trying to make there is that I do not consider myself. A socialist because I well for one I'm not an economist like I don't feel like I that 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 is a pretty substantial gap in my personal knowledge that I don't feel oh I can give you some books just do it do it <laughs> give it to give them to me uh the I don't feel confident in my ability to say like oh absolutely I'm a socialist uh however uh, and i do believe that we've had this conversation before it's something that i probably still... but they hadn't heard it oh, of course of course that's why we're still talking <laughs> uh something that i i still don't really budge on is um socialism in regards to uh like universal health care okay and i know that that's something that you disagree with mm -hmm. that's true what have we got Little, little old soul CBS selection. Oh, nice. Okay, this is a good one. It's 109 proof. It is a mm -hmm. high rye bourbon. Very tasty. Nice. I'm a big fan. Um, I obviously, I know we're running a little bit over time, so we can kind of. Who cares? Crank this out. We can talk uh, as much as we crank? want, really. Yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Man, just, that's a big change from the brand. Yeah, it is. Indeed. <laughs> it's three guys having a conversation in a room. Yeah. Yeah, we can keep talking. Like, there is no limit, really, here. Yeah, but it's it's nice to have a little bit of consistency, I would assume, with having such a long-running Yeah, but podcast. I just had a podcast, like, a few days ago, and it was, like, 30 minutes, where usually we're, like, an hour. I understand. Okay. Because I had to do it myself, and mm, I you... condense things better. <laughs> no, sorry. No. <laughs> well, no, I'm r curious r r what you're going to say now. <laughs> Uh, spotlights on you spotlights on me they just turned the microphone and put it in my face <laughs> so uh give me a refresher you guys were just talking about how he's not a communist <laughs> <laughs> something like that yeah. i don't i would not consider he myself, doesn't consider himself a socialist no but i i would say that i am for universal health care okay specifically. can i ask you something do you have kids no sir okay <laughs> a question he knows the answer to i do it was rhetorical but <laughs> um i do not think it is anyone else's responsibility to take care of me whatsoever so i, I can't remember the quote and i'll i'll hamburger meet it it was something to the effect of uh with my family i'm a socialist with my neighbors, I'm a Democrat. With my local government, I become libertarian, and it just gets worse from there on. Mm -hmm. Like, the whole point of it is, is like, you, that's why socialism doesn't work, is because of human nature. I want to protect you, mm -hmm. and I will take care of you till the day I die. 
and I will, I will do that. So now imagine you've got everyone in the world doing the same thing. They're just looking out for themselves, and you can't you can't get rid of that. You can't move past self interest. No, self interest is human nature, and there's nothing wrong with it. And I, I know that there's a lot of people out there that think that self interest we get is, demonized for it. Yeah, absolutely, but it's not. Like self interest is the way you should be. Who's more important than you and yours and the people around you and your friends and your colleagues? And like, that's what it gets, gets less and less as you move outwards. But, but the truth is that like, that's the most important thing is the people that you know, that are closest to you, that you love, that you care for. It becomes amplified when you have children and responsibilities too. And, and that's the advantage of capitalism there. That's the point that I was trying to make at the very beginning is that there is no system that is more effective at making people want to do things for people that they don't know than capitalism. Yeah, that was a Milton Friedman thing I saw that uh, he said something to the effect of like the, the, the man who buys grain doesn't care what color uh, the bread maker mm-hmm. is, you know. Yeah, and one of the things that um, that uh, Dave Smith, who's a libertarian and who a should comedian, run for president, <laughs> he's not doing it. It's already twenty passed. whatever every year. I'll vote <laughs> 20, for you every 24. year. <laughs> he's uh, supporting. Um, oh hell, I can't remember his name. Did Damn it. it! No, no, no. He's not Hornberger. No, uh, Hornberger's not the guy either. Um, he's uh, supporting uh, Michael Rechtenwald. I don't know him. Um, this is another reformed Marxist, by the way, uh, Michael Rechtenwald. He's, he's an interesting guy. I don't, I don't think that he's really like the best libertarian nomination because he's not that exciting. Like he's very good at making the arguments. Maybe that's exactly what we want, but he doesn't, he doesn't make people want to be on board. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I think that at least at this point in our existence as a party, we need somebody that like makes people want to be on board. Yes. Um, oh, well, what, what was the point that I was trying to make? <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about children and how like, uh, socialism, self-interest. Well, the, the thing that kickstarted everything was I made the, I made, I made the, I brought up the topic of healthcare in relation to capitalism. Yes. Well, the. Interference of government in healthcare has actually made healthcare more expensive, less accessible. There was a time before Medicare, Medicaid, and all this legislation where people were generally cared for. Like, and even still, like, there's not people, well, unfortunately, there are, but there was a time when there weren't generally people dying in the street because they couldn't afford their healthcare. And even now, that doesn't have to be. Like, if you show up at an ER... They have to treat you. If you're... Yeah. And, but that was always the case. And you've actually created a system now with all this legislation, and particularly the Affordable Care Act, which somehow tripled my health care costs, um, where... The patient gets less time, less interest, uh, less support, um, and it costs a whole lot more. The The interference of government in the healthcare system has um, created a problem that I, like, so I used to I used to be in the healthcare field, just, I, I think most listeners know this now, but... I um, was an EMT. I was an EMT. I, uh, I worked in the healthcare system for many years and I wrote an article. This was in the mid nine, no late nineties, I guess. Um, because it was during this time that Hillary Clinton was promoting universal healthcare under the Clinton administration. I wrote an article for the AJC, uh, that was opposed to universal healthcare because my thesis at the time which has turned out to be true, <laughs> um, was that it would raise health care costs and reduce health care quality. quality. Care. Yeah. And, and it has. 
So every step along the way that the government has interfered with the healthcare system, they have raised cost and reduced quality of care. And at this point, like it's hard to profit. And you're you're talking about uh, like doctors as a um, as an occupation that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. So so the last girl I dated was a doctor. Um, she was uh, finishing up her residency. She spent three hundred thousand dollars on her degree. She didn't have that money. I mean, like she's in debt for that degree, and her like the the ability for her to make money is very limited because of legislation. Oh, well, that was uh, so. I was going to college to be a nurse anesthetist. Okay, that was what I wanted to be. Oh, that's a great job. It too. was right, but yeah. so look the college, the college, the internship, all that stuff. So the median income at the time was like $5,000 more than what I was making as a um, unskilled laborer as a rig hand. Mm -hmm. Six-figure job, both of them. Yeah. So 10 years of college and internship versus I showed up today, I have a strong back and a weak mind. (laughs) Okay. Anyway, long story short, 17 years later, I'm still doing the same thing. Yeah. Not quite. Like you have a team, like right. I am a consultant. Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no. So, um, what what regulations did in the medical field was uh, create a situation where everything costs more, and you get a lower quality of care than you did before. I was in the medical field. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Which one of us? Oh, okay. Uh, how much do you pay for healthcare? How much do I pay for healthcare? Yes. How much do you pay for healthcare? Hmm. Um, I certainly have uh, healthcare debts that I'm still paying off right now. And and why is that? Hmm. Why is that? Uh, because even beyond insurance, healthcare costs were still very high for what I needed to do. Uh, specifically, uh, I went to go visit an ER to get an MRI, which... I accept the cost of that. Um, I understand that ER visits are very expensive and that um, that's that's the cost of not being on a wait list. In fields that aren't regulated by the government in healthcare, specifically. I mean, things of that nature. Right. Um, Costs have gone down, quality has gone up. But in, in the areas where government has interfered, Costs have gone up and quality has gone down. So would you would you argue for because I'm not gonna I'm, I, I absolutely agree with you. The healthcare system that we have currently in this country is imperfect, if not terrible, as mm-hmm. it stands at this moment. Um how would you compare a completely free market system without interference to say something that was completely socialized. So something that was completely um, government funded rather than government subsidized. Talk to the Canadians. I work with them all the time. They hate it. They come down here if they want to get good health care. If they got a cold, they go to their doctors. If they have something wrong with them, they come down here to ours. Yeah, th- this is the experience generally of the socialized health care system is that if you have something common, it's well cared for. And if you have something uncommon, get in line. It's not cared for at all. Um, so people that have serious problems generally come to unregulated markets like ours. If they have the money to do so. If they have the money to do so is the big caveat. But why is it so expensive, Mike? (laughs) It's so expensive because the the government has interfered with the system and picked winners and losers and not allowed a free market to push prices down. Because a free market does push prices down. If there's a demand in the market, then other people enter the market. And as other people enter the market, the competition itself pushes prices down. I see it every day in my job where people undercut each other and it like you look at it as a dirty thing, but it's not a dirty thing. It's just a, it's, it's a, a price of doing business. 
Mm-hmm. Um, if if he's going to sell me a loaf of bread for a dollar twenty five, and you're going to sell it to me for a dollar thirty five, where do you think I'm buying it from? Because I don't care who he is or what you are or who it it, it matters not to me. It's where can I get the most bang for my buck? Where can I save the most money? What can I do? Mm-hmm. Like that that's typically what you go for. The reason I brought up the whole healthcare thing to you is that like, he's right. So 10 years ago, sorry, I just point for me. Yeah. Um, 10 years ago, my healthcare cost me $425 a month. Now to insure a family out of, out of network because I don't work where I live was $1,425 per month out of pocket because I'm self-employed. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's less like I, like my, what do they call it? Your deductible or whatever. It's Mm -hmm. like $7,000. When I moved back to Alabama from Georgia in 2006, I did a Cobra extension on the uh, healthcare that I had in my previous job. It cost me 300 and something dollars a month. Now my, now Cobra extensions at the time, that's when you quit your job and <laughs> were three, four times higher than your general yep. healthcare costs. Now my healthcare, which my company pays half of, still costs me four hundred and something dollars a month for just for a like man. a yeah, for a single man basic health care. I mean, I go a little over the board because I have a history of kidney stones and, you know, they, they're pricey. So I have the, the higher level plan, but it still costs me uh, 50% more than my, my COBRA extension before the Affordable Care Act came into place. Yeah, and think about that. So he just said this almost the exact same dollar amount for my family of five, 10 years ago. Yeah, which also means, just as a reminder, because my company takes half of it, that it actually costs 300% what my standard health care plan cost before that. Government interference just picks winners and losers. It benefits companies. It doesn't benefit individuals. Like, even if you go back to just the... uh, I don't want to move us to the Federal Reserve where we're like so long. But like even if you just move to the the Federal Reserve's plan of 2% inflation every year, that benefits companies. It does not benefit individuals. Consumers pay more. Companies make more. That's how the system works. And it's built towards them. Not towards you. If you think the government is on your plan, uh, on your side, whether it's socialist or communist or Democrat or Republican, it d- doesn't matter. It's not on your side. the 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 best plan for you is to limit government interference to the greatest degree that you possibly can, and let the market do what it will, because the market itself. A free market, a voluntarist market, is about selling to you, and you have the power. With every dollar that you spend, you cast a vote about who is the best person in the market. And all the government does is move that power towards the corporation rather than the individual. So during this time, neither of us have tried to argue to you that the current air quotes, capitalist system that we have is the best one because we both agree that there's way too much government involvement and it's not a laissez-faire capitalist. Oh, no, not at all. Not. So we, we kind of agree with you that it's not a great system. It would be way better if we could just get government out of it completely and totally. Well, maybe not 100%, but like 99%. Oh, I would say 100% because the, the government is not interested in you. You don't have enough political power to push things in your direction. The, the, the diffuse population doesn't have enough shared self-interest to lobby in such a way to, 
to to their advantage. Would, Corporations do. Wouldn't you say that that's like in an argument against the the tenets of democracy itself? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I I am not a big fan of democracy. Me either. Um, I, I think uh, democracy is essentially mob rule. Uh, mob rule is never in the benefit of the whole, even though they think it is. Um, people are easily dissuaded from their own self-interest into... Um, Group sync? Almost. Yeah, I, I suppose so. That's probably the best. Uh, nobody heard you. Group think. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> um, where... The the idea of something better for the whole um, captures a lot of people, and they push towards something that's not actually in their own self interest, um, which I, I think is actually the opposite of the uh, the ideas that that um, the left wing has that the the people voting right wing in the South are not voting in their own self interest. I, I think that that's wrong. I think that people voting for their own choice in the matter is always in their self-interest. To limit government involvement, to um, to push towards a uh, a system of real voluntarism, where everybody's deciding for their sel- themselves what's best for themselves, because the system doesn't know what's best for people, and the idea of democracy ends up being particularly in, in this country now, like if you talk about the, um, the total vote, the, what's the, 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 vo- the, you're talking about like, like electoral college and all that stuff? I guess I'm, you're definitely out of the, I know I'm doing out of he's sorry, <laughs> Greg mentioned briefly the electoral college and how the, the voting system, like the nature of it. In like I'm still a big advocate of, of the electoral college actually in terms of, as opposed to the popular vote, that's, what I'm so trying that's, to that's what you're critiquing mainly isn't necessarily the notion of democracy, but the notion of a complete democracy, of a complete popular. Oh, vote. yeah, absolutely. Like this system was developed to oppose ex- specifically that. Um, the idea, so um, Benjamin Franklin had the quote about democracy is two wolves and a lamb. Voting on what to have for lunch. And there's real truth to that. And I, I, I think that the the urban center democracy that kind of dictates to the um, the suburbs and the um, the rural areas what the way they should be is just wrong. Because the the center the city centers don't understand what life is like for a rural farmer. Farmer, I've had enough to drink now that I'm. <laughs> Yay! I like it. <laughs> We're getting loose here. <laughs> um, and there's a real problem with democracy anyway. Like, okay, so if you really want to walk out of here with a uh, with an economics book that will change your life, I'm going to send you home with Democracy: The God That Failed. Uh, which is Hans Hermann Hoppe. Don't be a bitch. Take it. <laughs> Sorry, I know he doesn't cuss on this podcast, but I'm. I try not to. I'm oh well, <laughs> I'm not perfect. Um, which is really about the idea that um, I don't know how to summarize this in a, in a small you don't have to. sense. Uh, everybody should read "Democracy: The God That Failed" by Hans Hermann Hoppe. Um, it's a very democratic look on government. And what it suggests is that in a democracy, that the, the leaders in a democracy are incentivized to extract as much from the system as they possibly can during the time that they're in office. Whereas, and he's not advocating, I should say, a... Um, Republic or... He's not really advocating anything but a uh, voluntarist system, but mm-hmm. he's not advocating a, um, a kingly system, a um, 
You know the term. Authoritarian or, uh, um, gosh, I can't think of the word either. I know what you're talking about. Feudalism? No, no, he's talking well, about... Well, yeah, I mean, to a, a degree, yeah. yeah. Um, a, yeah, what is I a, don't know. a king? We, no, like, why can't I come up We've had a little bit this? to drink. <laughs> anyway, um, he, he's not advocating a, a, a feudalist system or what have you, but he is saying that in a feudalist system that the um, the leader is incentivized to grow the wealth for, for posterity. For the people. Well, no, for his no. son and his, <laughs> so forth. But it, it grows the wealth for everybody. It's, again, that idea. Yeah, but what happens if they didn't like him back then? They fucking killed him. That did not happen very often. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Definitely going to have to mark this explicit now. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Just cut that part out. I, there's no, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very free form podcast format. Yeah. Um, so I guess if, if we were going to round everything off, maybe come to some sort of conclusion. Uh, Are you trying to finish this podcast? He's been trying to finish it for the last like 32 minutes and I'm just keep trying to egg it on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we're going to come to a point to this, then I suppose. So you would reject just the the notion of like a, a a full mob rule democracy absolutely yeah for an absolute so, democracy where everybody gets a say and the majority rules there's a problem there so then aside from what we already have in place the electoral college what else would you propose in its place? Uh, okay. Because obviously I feudal... I actually have an answer for this. Okay, that's uh, good, because I don't think that most people would like to go back to feudalism. Please, no, no, no. Thing I'm going to say. Go ahead. Go, no, you go first. Uh, I like the idea of a ranked voting system, because it's hard to beat. Like okay. you, you can't cheat it, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you your number one doesn't match with my number one, or my number two, number three, it just goes in the order of... so. You pick first, second, third, fourth, fifth place. You rank all of your choices in order. How do you know which ones I'm going to pick? You don't. No one does. So I think it's probably the best worst case scenario. Okay. Or, or we should go back to written ballots with like my name on it. Dude, I, I definitely um, am a proponent of not a secret vote. Yeah. The QR codes? I, I like the idea of you having to sup to publicly support whatever your support is. Um, a, a secret vote actually also creates the situation where you can't know if it's valid or not. Right. Like it can be, it can be easily manipulated with a secret vote because nobody can know what the total really was it's it's the it's the precarious situation of like you want people to be able to make their votes um without reprise yeah exactly without yeah. scrutiny without being able to it, it, you you said it perfectly uh but like you said it's also very hard to regulate that in the sense of like the validity of each vote absolutely um so that's definitely a flaw inherent in that. Um, but you you said that you actually had an answer for, okay, so aside from democracy or like complete mob mentality, nice what do you have to offer in opposition to that? Um, wh what I would advocate is the electoral college, but that the uh, votes are actually split. So each region what what are they called in the I system know. now no the jeez uh, it's not a caucus but I, I, no 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 um but the various congressional regions actually have their votes split based on where they go all right so instead of alabama taking its i want to say 8 <laughs> now i'm not counties, yeah. now i'm not sure uh, now that I'm having to say it, maybe it's nine. I don't remember. Anyway, without Alabama taking their eight electoral votes and putting them towards a single candidate, that the the actual individual region votes go towards the candidate that that region voted for. 
and then maybe having the Senate votes Rather. Uh, go towards the whoever won as a whole because that's the kind of the point of the Senate votes anyway. Because if you don't know now, the Electoral College does not have to listen to your votes. Well, that's true too. Um, so the Electoral College can take the votes of the state and completely throw them out. Um, but generally speaking, what happens is whoever wins the state as a whole gets all all of the electoral college votes. Yeah, that's that's usually how it works. So you would propose that instead we go There's by... only two states that actually split their votes right now, which is Maine and Arizona. That's crazy. So mm. you would propose like we go by each electoral district rather than district. Go, there you go. go that's the by, word. <laughs> go state by state. Yes, exactly. Reiterate we've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. So, so yeah, no, I I completely agree with that. I think that that sounds very reasonable. And then you can um, have the Senate votes, the the two Senate votes, go towards whoever won the state as a whole or whatever. That's fine. Yeah. The, the uh, like because that's kind of the point of the Senate votes anyway is to have to give the state itself a, a level of power that it didn't have if you divided everything up by the of representatives. Uh, the only so. issue you get into therein is the. Um, I mean, obviously, this is an issue inherent in like we us going state by state. I mm -hmm. think it still would be an issue, but in a different way. Uh, the whole gerrymandering thing. Uh, oh, sure. How I mean, that's, that's always going to be a problem, though. I don't know that you can alleviate that in any way. That's called government involvement. <laughs> yeah. Well. I mean, it's this. That's kind of the nature and the beast in this scenario. If it's like government voting, if, yeah. If we're, Voting for specific legislation, like I, I with it, it would also open things up to uh, additional parties, um, because the electoral college as it exists now supports the two party system. Yeah, they don't. It, 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 it incentivizes the state to throw all their votes into a particular party. Um, whereas you actually, if you divided down the vote into the various electoral districts and let them split their vote however they do, um, it it does give more power to additional parties. And I think that's really important because my, my personal electoral philosophy, I guess you would say, is that I always vote for third parties and I always vote against the incumbent. Yeah, of course. I mean, you're, you're, a, lib you're a libertarian, so you like by your nature, are going to support the third party over the predominant two. Even if it's the Green Party. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that's the truth, though, is that I, I think that the Republicans and the Democrats are failed. I mean, we have had 150 years of Democrat or Republican rule, mm. and are we better off? I don't think so. And while a lot of times it does come down to the big two, at least other countries do have other parties that have some sort of say, where yeah. with us, we just got the two to pick from. That's about it. Yeah, and the truth is that at this point, the two to pick from, they don't give a shit about you because we've already gotten to yeah, the point where I have well, to no. explicit. Yeah. I said thing. an F-bomb, so now he can say the S word. <laughs> they, they don't give a shit about you. Um, so the, the, the two-party system... Uh, actually, like, kind of incentivizes the, like, one or the other. Like, we have to pick the this one as opposed to picking that one. And that's that's kind of the power of the two parties, is that it's, it's more effective to get you to vote based on fear of the other side than to get you to vote based on support of one side. It's a form of control to get the populace pitted against each other rather than their eyes focused on the government. Absolutely. Itself. So you don't vote for the Libertarian or the Green Party or who the Constitutional Party, whatever you're, it happens to be. You're throwing your vote away. Yeah. Because, yeah, because you're throwing, throwing your vote away. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't vote for the Republican or the Democrat, you're voting for the other side in effect. That's what I've been told in every single instance that I've voted for a third party and it's very yeah. frustrating because yeah. that goes against the whole idea of our democratic system and it makes me very don't look at that <laughs> well no it, it, and exactly that's the point that I make all the time is that a vote for a candidate that you don't believe in that's a wasted vote absolutely so you guys argued earlier 
well, you didn't really argue, but you both agreed that the uh, probably one of the most influential in his power or presence or whatever you want to call it uh, was Donald Trump. And I would like to argue that it is Ross Perot. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. Because why? Because yeah. why, Michael? He changed our voting system. Because he got in the debates. Exactly. He was publicly televised. Mm-hmm. I don't have much to say on this, so I'm going to go grab another drink. You guys can go ahead. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for those that don't know, uh, I forget what the number is. I think it's like 15%. This is cr- the Christmas Eve Spectacular. Christmas <laughs> Eve Spectacular. Yeah, we've yeah. been uh, imbibing and enjoying each other. We're all going to go after this, hang out with mom. And drink more. Drink more. Somehow. Yeah, terrible idea. But so... Uh, I'm, I'm actually awaiting some deliveries. Oh. Specifically. For today. So, oh, nice. Uh, we'll see what happens. So, so what was unique? Y'all about- didn't see anything at the door when you came in. No, no, you? I didn't. Damn no, it. No. All right. So you, you're, you're older than I am, and so you're probably more cognizant of. Like I've heard of Ross Perot secondhand. I remember seeing him on TV, but I was like ten. Mm-hmm. So you were fourteen, fifteen, probably. Um, yeah. So his influence in like the way we vote changed everything because of why like it's what well the main thing that it changed is that the people that controlled the debates changed after him but why is that important it's important because it limits the um the points of view that you're allowed to hear so if you're a third party a, a libertarian and independent something else yeah you're essentially eliminated from public debates nationalized television debates you exactly. don't get to be a part of like anything on TV and and mm-hmm. you're relegated to second and they hand. keep changing the rules as you go along so even if you meet their requirements then they change the requirements yep so that's that's why like for me I like to claim that Ross Pro with his 15% like change that's a huge percentage it is like you think about it and he paid for it himself he Mm -hmm. paid for it which means he's a a rich guy too but whatever i just like the idea of what he did like he just pointed out all the things like hey here's here's why you should vote for me these are all the things i probably wouldn't have voted for him i'm not you know whatever but yeah i i that guy to me is uh I don't know, bootstraps, pull yourself up, do it yourself. Yeah, um, he uh, he definitely changed the way things go. He was the first legitimate independent candidate in who knows how long. Right. Um, and the result of him was that the, it was the, uh, the Women's Voter League, or I don't remember what it was called, that managed the debates before him. And after him, it was a bipartisan uh group that managed the debates so neither party wanted him in yeah neither party wanted him in and a third party was never really going to be televised in such a way no competition yeah exactly so it's always going to be between the republican and the democrat um we face that really seriously in the state. This Alabama is one of the states that is the hardest to get on the ballot as a third party. It, the Republicans and the Democrats, their candidate is just put on the ballot pretty much. Oh, really? I mean, like they have to they have to do essentially nothing to get listed on the ballot. But if you're not a Republican or a Democrat, if you're trying to run as an independent or as a third party, you have to jump through a whole lot of hoops to even be listed on the ballot. Really? I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, it costs quite a bit of money. It requires a huge amount of signatures. Um, the uh, The rule is that if you get 20% of the ballot in any at any level, that you don't have to do that for lower levels. So if um, you are competing for a federal level position and you get 20 percent of the ballot then you don't have to get all those signatures for anything lower than that any state any local oh. county etc okay um the problem is that it's very hard to get that level especially in a three-way race so i ran years ago uh for um the uh, uh board of education at the local level I got 6% of the total vote. Wow. Which sounds okay. 
as a libertarian. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, I mean, it's uh, they're low numbers for us, but uh, F word you, we care. Yeah, but I got 16% of the vote of people that didn't vote single ticket. Oh, wow. Which means one out of six people that didn't just say all Republicans or all Democrats voted for me. Um, and that was more or less the level of a lot of people at, at, at kind of local levels. I feel like a lot of that is, is that, that same thing you go back to, that fear of I'm throwing my vote away. Yeah, if I don't... Well, and it's ridiculous in Alabama particularly oh, yeah, no, because I, I grew if, up you're, here. Like, if you're voting for the Democrat, you're, voting, yeah. you're throwing your vote away in this part of the country. 100%. Yeah, um, you, you this might is one well. of the reddest areas of the country right now. Down here, I live in Tennessee. So, like when, uh, like the same way, like when it was uh, the night for the elections came out and California popped up, mm -hmm. and it was just like immediately, like, well, California is blue. It was the same thing for Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as Tennessee popped, it was like check mark red. We're good. There's only two blue spots. It's Memphis and Nashville. Mm -hmm. So I hear you. And you live in Nashville. Uh, yeah, I live in Nashville, and I work in the Bakken. In North Dakota. Where do you vote? Uh, so I, it, it's kind of hard. So I keep my tribal ID so that I can vote in local elections in North Dakota. Okay. So um, as a, uh, what do they call you even now? Indigenous. Indigenous American. Yeah. Okay. We, we call each other Indians. Indians. <laughs> Indians. <laughs> Indians? Yeah, well, it's, no, not Indians. It's Indian. 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 We, we call ourselves Indians, but you're you're not allowed to do that. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. I can't say it's, that. it's it's like <laughs> it's it's yeah. It's that it's that ethnic thing where like you know there's certain parties that are allowed to call <laughs> each other certain words. It's the same thing, but yeah. So Indians, uh, Indians, Indians, Indigenous. Indigenous is more of like a Canadian thing, okay. uh, or First Peoples. We just call it oh, no, Native. First Am Peoples is the Canadian, super thing. Canadian. I always just say natives. Yeah, but so uh, I if, like Indigenous Americans. Indigenous American sounds good. Um, when Indians hear white people call us natives, we take it. It's like a. It's like the N word. It's like the N word, my friend. Oh yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, so you're native? That's what <laughs> the I hear. Other N word. That's what I hear every time. But yeah, so so we have uh, a similarly corrupt system uh, there as well. Um, but well, we, but you're you're outside of the U.S. system, though, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. But it's uh, I always laugh because my. Before oil and gas existed there, it was a very poor, 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 poor place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. We've gone like 32 subjects, right? Um, and, and it I didn't... I don't mind. I have to pee this. I do you too. You guys might have I do to too. fill in. For but so like it, it was this thing. Yeah, I'd love to talk to him too. But so it was this thing where like uh, it didn't matter how you voted. You voted for the guy that stayed there for forever that was going to give your cousin a job. And oh, he knows my boy, so... We're going to go ahead and I'm going to vote for him because though he didn't graduate high school. <laughs> I like that you're doing the accent. Too. Yeah, sorry. It's just, it <laughs> no, happens. do it. It's awesome. But uh, as <laughs> no, an, it's more fodder to get our podcast banned. It was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the last election, I like vividly remember, like we, we started getting oil and gas money and we had a chairman who um, was probably closer to a Donald Trump type. I mean, he, he cowboys are super popular. So he wore the the bedazzled belts and the fancy hats and uh he created a people's fund that was a, a non-FDIC insured uh fund and the idea was was that like hey, we're going to put all this oil money and this revenue from generating they called it Taro, Tribal Enrollment Regulatory Offices. Um if you wanted to come do work on the reservation, you had to get a sticker for your car and you had to get a registration for your business to come work on. Essentially, you had to pay for all these things, right? Yeah, you, you, of your course. business, Michael's business, because he's a non indigenous person coming to work on our country. Mm -hmm. You had to get these things. And we took that tax, essentially, is what it was. I went to the uh, New Year's fish show. On oh, on the Cree reservation? reservation. Yeah, there you go. That's a good one too. <laughs> but so, so that money, uh, the idea was to leave it in there until it made X amount of millions of dollars. And at that point, if it had sat in there for approximately ten years, 
every, which is, I don't think this is a good idea. It just, it would have been nice, right? Every person that was at least one eighth Native American could have received $52,000 a year. Okay. As like a, a salary. And then, yeah, you could have pursued other things. You probably would have became lazy. And, and I mean, that's what I would have done, right? If I'm getting 52 grand a year, I'm not. I don't believe that that's true. Yeah, I know. I'm wound, I'm wound up tighter than heck. But anyway, so um, the next guy that Greg came. would have become lazy. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah, totally. He's the, the biggest couch potato. <laughs> guy who can't, like, sit down for five minutes without, like... Going crazy. Getting into a cold sweat. Yeah. I don't know how to relax. The only way I can do it is with bourbon. Um, we're but, trying. Yeah, I know. We're trying. So, so anyway, <laughs> this guy got booted out. That's the point of the story. And, and the way that he was booted out was um, the next guy came in and said, I'm going to take that people's fund and I'm going to give it to you every six months in $1,000 increments. So he paid. He paid us. Um, I, I still to this day benefit from that system, me and my daughter. We get paid $1,000 every six months. Um, but he depleted that fund, that fund completely. So during COVID, he had to borrow money from the government to uh, your, ta- your tax dollars to give me a thousand dollars and my daughter a thousand dollars happy to do it oh you know? god yeah I'd, I'd rather ask you for the money than you give it to me for free <laughs> wait till you get your christmas gift <laughs> oh geez this is terrible i feel bad i don't feel like i bought him the right stuff after drinking all of his bourbon okay you guys have a I'm conversation so happy right. to share it. no oh god yeah i got a p2 <laughs> There you go. Man, you just, you really did that to him. You got him Dude, stuck here. I have here. a bathroom. You don't have to go out the door. <laughs> Is he going to go out back? Fucking Indians, you know? Gee. <laughs> okay. You, look, you don't need to worry about him getting your podcast banned. You're going to do that your own damn self. Uh, yeah. I, I try. I don't like no-no words. No, no words. Yeah, no, no words. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of things that I'm not allowed to say. Like you tell me, I'm not allowed to say something. I'm more likely to say it because I just think that's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, seriously. I think, I think speech, that we're right? like, oh, yes, freedom of speech is very important. I think that, uh, especially as someone, suffer the consequences of that if they want to take me off of YouTube. Whatever, I don't care. I, I, or, or suffer the social consequences as well. Like you, eh. you have the. Well, I what I mean when I say that is that you have the constitutional right to be an asshole, but you're uh, still sure. you're still being an asshole, yeah. and you're still gonna suffer like the social consequences of that. <laughs> you like think you I'm might being get an asshole by calling him a fucking Indian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we have had too much to drink. <laughs> and th- I appreciate that. You're you know. Uric acid isn't really that good for but, the plants, but but no, what I what I what I mean is that it's like I think that that's language and how we speak and how we treat each other is very important. I think that that's very important on this on the personal level. Mm-hmm. Like, so I have a very I have a soft spot for, for very much for art. Like, mm-hmm. I consider myself a musician. I love music. I love most forms of art. I think I you used should to be say that of myself. I'm- yeah, not sure anymore. But um, because of that, I think that um, because of that, freedom of speech is very important to me, and I think that you should have the ability to say or do whatever you want with artistic merit. And I think that that applies to anything, whether in regards. If you take to, the art out of it, am I still allowed to say? Yeah, that but no, 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 no. That's that's. I'm explaining to you. Okay. Why okay. that is important to me specifically, but. It's important in all regards. Do you now, understand how that's like trying? You're trying to compel our speech, though. That's the problem. You're taking away the same amendment you're talking about. I don't. I don't know what you mean. Okay, you guys talk about okay. that. I'll go. So, I'll go to steal your chair. Yeah, <laughs> y- your your argument. If you could repeat it again, I I came out on the tail end of it. Was that no, you it, didn't come out in the tail. I was still making it. No, no, no. So I, so you you talked about like the artistic nature and like freedom of speech. And so my argument to you though is that like uh, w- we had a conversation earlier about I met a person and and I'm I'm curtailing my speech. I'm catering it to this individual that I don't know and I don't care about and I have nothing. I, I don't know them. 
but it was a person with uh, self-inflicted dissociative identity disorder that was like all broken and messed up. And they called themselves we. They said we had four different identities. Why right now, as I'm having this conversation with you, uh, 1,600 miles away from that place, should I have to change my speech for someone? That's not freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is for me to go, it was a crazy girl I met, and for there to be no repercussions for me to say what was actually true, that it was a girl that was uh, had a terrible upbringing and was incapable of dealing with the positions that she was put in because her mind was enfeebled or whatever you want to call it. That's probably a poor example. I'm the, my, my answer to that is that that's not the argument I was making. Oh, my bad. At all. I'm sorry. Like that, that's, that's kind of what I meant where I was like, I was sort of on the, in the middle of it where I, the reason why I care so much for freedom of speech and freedom of expression is because obviously I see a lot of its artistic merit, but also it's very important within journalism. It's very important within your, um, within you as a citizen to be able to do without fear of any sort of legal or otherwise repercussions for doing so. Government. Um, yes. Social repercussions, th- those are like completely like... Yeah, that's... People are going to react the way... You're not protected from that. Like, you're not. A dude might eat you in the mouth. That's what I was saying, is that it's like you have the constitutional right to be an asshole, but you're still being an asshole. That's yeah. not what I'm saying that you were doing, but like that's... The argument that I was making. How do you feel about the is, canceling, though? Is that uh, that? Sorry, I didn't mean to like sidetrack you again. Yeah, no. So, so to finish the argument that I was making is that I think freedom of speech and freedom of, ex- of expression is incredibly important. You should be able to say whatever you are going to say. But I do think that, at least on the personal level, that there is no shame in like because, like for instance, you treat you would consider me. And are my sisters and my mother is part of your family. No, you are. You would not treat us the same way as you would treat anyone else. No, I would kill for you. That's what I would I die mean. for you. That's yeah. what I mean in the sense of it's different on the personal level. If it's someone you respect or if it's a friend of yours, if it's someone... No, but I, I, I'm weird that way, my friend, where they're... Uh, so I, I have an odd sense of right and wrong where it regardless or my least favorite word, irregardless. <laughs> um, if you're wrong, you're wrong. I don't care. Like my sense of right and wrong is so like, I mean, so you, you know, my family, you, your best friend is my brother and not to bring him into this or make it a big thing, but he, he's, he's my blood, right? So should I have a stronger, should I make concessions for him? Do I? No, I don't. I would never. I won't do that. I won't do it for you either. I'm just saying. Like, oh yeah, he needs to. Re- I forgot we have. Sharing, sure, we're back to sharing a microphone. Mike is back from his pee break. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Oh, I feel <laughs> way better. I mean, you announced it yourself, sir. Uh, no, it's. I, I, Make, so, making concessions like I the, the way that you say that is like it's like oh I'm like holding something back or I'm like blah, blah. I've never felt that way in talking to a friend if someone for instance um I look we're not going to get very too deep into the trans the transgender topic or what Oh, why not? The various opinions that we have into this. We have, are we running... Got unlimited time. Yeah, we're here. We don't have to be in a We're over two hours already, so... Well, I also... Uh, like, Mike, I also don't want to get you into trouble. <laughs> oh. He's discussed trans before. Yeah, it's... This is not um, a new topic. But, um... Well, obviously, I... You know me. You know that me, as a person, in the way that I feel, I am... Everyone, I'm no? very... I don't care. Um, I'm, I'm very... I'm very. Can't sp- hear you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm arguing with this man, this mysterious man off camera or off microphone. Yeah, off axis. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, Get more microphones. <laughs> actually, that picked up. Sorry, man. I only have actually two XLR inputs. Mm-hmm. So. 
on so the recorder? I've had transgender people in my life, people I would consider friends. Oh, um, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, people, me too. People I would consider friends and people who I respect to a great degree. I respect their experiences and I don't think that I am in a position to... Like, that's, that's not something that I'm like, I'm going to challenge you on that. Because I think that their experiences are very valid. I think that... But why should they be able to challenge your position? It's not a... Why... What do you mean when you say that? So, if, if by chance I run into one of your transgender people that you have a lot of respect for... And they, uh, uh, they to me, they look like a straight up dude. If I'm like, oh, excuse me, sir, why all of a sudden now? I mean, that's I'm. This is a tear. We should not go down this road. Let's do it. Come on. It's so bad though. Like, uh, I'm per- not afraid. I don't know why. You okay, mean. I'm not afraid. It's like perception, right? Mm-hmm. The perception is is what it is. If 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 you look like I mean if there's beautiful men in Thailand, I've seen them, right? <laughs> but they're still men, and that's okay. I don't care. I really don't. What you want to do with your body is your choice. That's fine. Does not bother me. You cannot tell me though that I have to call you lady. Yeah, the feeling of offense is actually the kind of strange aspect of this whole thing. But 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 guess what? Every single reasonable transgender person i've ever met someone who i would consider a friend it's not that big a deal well but here's the problem that you run into is that it's not the reasonable transgender transgender people that you that are the the issue here is the activists it's look there's gonna be plenty of squeaky wheels you're gonna see them making tiktoks online and whatnot i don't that's not a good representation of the average transgen- transgender person. I See, think that's the, hard to say when you've had enough to drink. Yeah. Because I, <laughs> no, I look. Can you go back to saying the other word? I. <laughs> what was the other word? No, the, don't you dare. Okay, look, I, I, I said I was talking earlier about you know like oh don't, don't be afraid, but absolutely be afraid of that. <laughs> You don't want to get Mike to get pulled off of whatever streaming services he's Transvestite? on. Transvestite? Is that the other word? No, we're, we'll just stop. Mike. Let's just okay. stop now. Right, no, so, uh, but no, like, they, it's honestly in in my experience, hey, we're talking about anecdotes now, um, is most... <laughs> Good use of the word. Yeah. Well done. I prefer esoteric. <laughs> Uh, that, esoteric actually is probably the most appropriate word most, for this. Most reasonable. This whole discussion. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's all life experience. Most, most reasonable and non And interested, and, and only interests a very small <laughs> percentage of the population. <laughs> m- m- reasonable and non delusional per- people that you will meet, because I would consider uh, like a lot of transgender people to fit in that bubble. Um, they're just people. They're just people trying to find their own inner peace, trying to find yeah, their own sure. way through I, life. So and in terms of the esoteric portion of this, when I was in uh, in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago, uh, the topic came up a couple of times with my cousin, um, who's an expat at this point. And he was like, I don't hear anybody talk about this. Like, you're the only person that I've ever heard talk about this in years it's just like a non-issue everywhere else it's a thing here yeah and and i was trying to explain to him it's a thing here because people perceive it rightly or wrongly as an attack on their children and that's really the issue that that people have about it i i think that the majority there are certainly people that just like have problems with gays or have problems with transgenders or whatever um, but the majority of people only have an issue with this mm-hmm. at all because they feel like it's something that's being pushed on their children. Think of the children. They don't Think of the children. If you wanted this podcast to be five hours long, you could start getting me talking about DeSantis. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I am not a fan. <laughs> oh, so you guys I, are Bone Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, like. My I mean, DeSantis issue is 
primarily um, his uh, his time as a JAG and down in um, Cuba. Oh, Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with like I'm supporting the various arguments that we have for torturing the people that are in Guantanamo and. You know, whatever. It wasn't torture. It was enhanced interrogation, Michael. Right. Whatever we want to call it. I was in the it. Marine Corps at this time. It was enhanced interrogation. <laughs> enhanced <laughs> interrogation, which many studies have shown doesn't work really great because people will say whatever they can to not be tortured. Mm. I went through it in Sears school. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> Is that, <yes. laughs> besides, which also means this ineffective, right? Yeah. Besides the point. Fuck. Also, <laughs> also the the Sears school, not to take away from your experiences, because obviously they were, from what you have told me, they've worked. Those are one of the best episodes of the unit. Were very intense. Yeah, um, I had a... Uh, we can't hear you. So, Try again. So, right. yes. So the en enhanced interrogation, I can imagine, is probably pretty terrible, the torture. Uh, doing Sears school... Uh, the, the worst form is not the navies, which is what I went through. Um, we did uh, a week of like classroom type stuff, and then we did a week of survival in Brunswick, Maine in January. Okay. That's so rough, though. It was I terrible. Mean, I slept yeah. in snow caves. I punched holes through creeks to get water and put iodine tablets in them. I didn't eat for a week um, other than the squirrel that we killed. <laughs> And, and, and we, the squirrels are never good. No. And it's, I mean, it's, you, you, you've got a group of eight people and then on that final day you have to get captured. Um, okay. it's, it's a requirement for obviously to graduate from the class. So I had to get captured and you do, you get, uh, stripped down naked in negative 40 degree weather in front of men and women. They don't care. And you're forced to climb through like a, a dog door, like a doggy door. And then you, you meet someone. And, and so all of these people have uh, uh, the part that stuck with me, I guess. The whole point of this thing is that, like, it is it's traumatizing, even if, like, you're a tough guy, John Wayne, whatever, you know, John Wick, like, I would like to think I am. I'm not. We all pretend to be what we're not, right? So um, long story short, they all spoke with Russian accents or, like, Eastern European Russians. <laughs> yeah, everyone, you know. They sounded like they were Russian, and they That's kept... That's hilarious. They kept you awake. They beat you. Uh, it was always open-handed. They picked on the women. When was this? Uh, 2002. Why didn't they speak with Arabic accents? Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't ask It them. seems like they should have at the time. Probably. Just, the, the military in general is very slow to pick up on current trends anyway. It's not bad. So, yeah, so they beat us, they slapped us around, like, you had to sit in certain positions, and, like, the whole idea was to resist against this thing, like, you know, they wanted you to sit a certain way, they wanted you to do a certain thing, and so it was like, it was like that silent protest of, like, where you're kind of doing what they want, but not, anyway, um, they did do, I, I was uh, modified waterboarded, it's not the way they do it with, like, the towel, it was like a, a hose in your face. They just put a hose underneath your nose and then poured the gallon of water. That still sounds pretty it was, shitty. It's pretty terrible. They would put you in a box cross-legged and you had to like sit. Uh, back in the day, we called it Indian style, which I'm allowed to say because I'm an Indian. Um, you would sit. <laughs> but I'm not. You're not. Yeah. You have <laughs> okay, to say. Chris, you, you have to say. Trying Chris, to set the boundaries. Yeah. You got to say crisscross applesauce. Um, <laughs> so you would sit Indian style in this box and they would fold you forward at the hips and then would beat the hose and ask you to say off your number because we were all given tags like the Jews back in the day. Um, so I was war criminal number 62. It's stuck in my brain forever. But I, I always said I was... 62 isn't even a good number. It's not. It's a terrible number. I'd rather be nine. Um, That's a good number. It's a good number, right? right. So uh, I said prisoner of war number 62, and they would beat me every time I said prisoner of war instead of war criminal. And then, but they sit you in that box so long that you can't feel your legs. And so they drag you around and then you're physically abused. You're forced to stand on the American flag and wipe your feet with it and whatnot. Anyway, um, at the end of it, like you go through this, you know, it's, it, it feels like it's three days, but it's only 24 hours. Uh, and you have this ceremony where they make you salute. And what's weird is that like 
the way they had us salute, the way they taught us to salute was with your, your fist over your heart. And they take this picture of you when everyone in that unit does it. And how, how are military members, how do military people salute the American flag? You, you do it with, yeah. Like a salute. With an actual like tip of the hat, you know, the old English homage. Mm -hmm. Every single person did the hand over the heart and they took pictures of us and showed us later that like, hey, you can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. I That's guess, probably an important lesson. Yeah, actually. long story short, the thing that messed me up was, um, and I didn't think it did during the time while I was doing it, I went and watched Super Troopers. <laughs> okay. It came out in the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a Russian accent. In Super Troopers? The servers. I went to a KFC. I went to different restaurants. It's like, it's like that. Uh, I hate saying this word. Tra trauma. Traumatized. So I got like, it's PTSD is a real thing. I don't have PTSD. But like, that was like a mini thing where like everyone it's I definitely think I'm actually signed up to a webinar about PTSD and like, Early January. Yeah, so so I imagine I feel for those guys that like you know saw their brothers dies and I I didn't I didn't deal with that but like just that one week of like waking up to AK forty sevens going off and like fake Russian being spoken like every I watched uh, I watched television I watched Super Troopers everyone had a Russian accent and I, it was so weird to me I thought it was just me and then I I posed Meow. it. I, yes, I posed that question in the class the next day, like it was our ex, you know, like we're leaving this class. And I said, hey, uh, so yesterday everyone had a Russian accent. And they said it's a normal thing. And like your brain gets jacked up in that way. You get traumatized where, God, oh my God, I just said it. Traumatized. Yes. You did. I did, I did. I, I mean. I Nobody a, can hear you. Brandon's been traumatized too. Bad news, Brandon is unheard. <laughs> we'll give it back. Um, <laughs> what's the next question? What's the next question? Well, geez, what were we, where were we talking about? Uh, we were talking about transgender stuff. Oh, okay. And how? And how? Uh... <laughs> fighting over the microphone. No, right? we're not fighting over it. So, <laughs> um. I am the only person in this room that has kids. And you'd mentioned several times about like the whole, whether it's perceived as real or not, or like... Okay, here's my, my thing about transgenderism. If we accept gender dysphoria as an actual psychological Disease, yeah. Yeah. disorder, which I, I think... It we, is. Yeah, if I'm yeah. good with it. I, I certainly accept gender dysphoria is a yep. is a legitimate psychological disorder. Me too. Why is it the only as far as I know psychological disorder where the treatment of it is lean in. Let's change everyone else's perspective and and just like yeah, I don't Like if if I go to the psychiatrist with a problem of Your um, you mean your problem? Yeah, with the my problem, problem, problem you have with yourself. Yes, okay, yeah, exactly. no, I was just wondering. With, <laughs> with my problem, I don't know why we're making this about me. I was really trying to avoid that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean you actually had a mental problem, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no. Oh, I do. We all do. Um, if, if we go into the psychiatrist with my particular problem of uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah. the psychiatrist is not okay. This is how we intensify your problem, but deal with it. Why is gender dysphoria the only one that we do that with? Uh, Brandon would like to speak because he looks super excited. Hi, it's me. I have the microphone now. <laughs> um. I would go as far as to make the argument that the gender dysphoria diagnosis doesn't matter. In, I, what do you mean? I would so I would go as far as to so. Oh man, my raging liberal is going to come out now. It's going to be great. So <laughs> awesome. the I'll have a lot to say. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, so obviously there is a difference between sex and gender. Gender is gender is um, the 
perception that gender is the societal impact rules. on it's the societal rule exactly okay. where, where where sex yeah. is like just the oh what's between your legs uh it's the chromosomes actually because it's not necessarily just between your legs yes the XY and that thing is different that, from the xx thing and it doesn't always show until you're like a teenager not only that but also another big uh argument for people who are non-binary or transgender is the fact that there's a lot more combinations than just xx or xy uh there's a lot more there's xxy yeah there's that's a, it there's three no, there's there's more than that. There's the, there are a, a few different combinations you that can happen. Why lie, bro? <laughs> the point is that inter intersex people exist. Uh, yeah, but that's okay. So intersex people is an X Y with a genetic defect that doesn't present the Y part of the chromosome connection that's, until that's, later in life that's not the only way that it can present itself there's other different versions of intersex that exist and what are they the, <laughs> you want to know you want to get me to like like yes. pull out the pull yeah. out the book describe them if you're describing them i mean you're defending it so describe them <laughs> i mean a dad I, I know what you're doing uh, no, the, the point I'm trying to make is that no matter what, for intersex people who don't fit comfortably between the two gender norms that we have within our society, they have that struggle to go through that most people don't have where it's like, okay, how am I going to present myself? How am I going to carry myself? See, this is a, a point where I disagree. I think that everybody has that struggle. So this is a point in the podcast that I would like to make that uh, Michael, Greg, and Brandon, we don't care. We really don't. You okay, love that, you yeah. love who you want to love. You do to your body what you want to do. That is your choice. It's no one else's. We don't we don't give a shit. Yes, I agree with that a hundred percent. We all have our specific opinions, and we're giving them to you. We're not saying that that's how you should feel or anyone else should feel. We're just discussing how we feel. Thank and you for keeping us monetized. <laughs> yeah, this is specifically a bunch of cisgender people talking about what they feel about something that they have no experience in. Like, please uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so it depends on how you define experience again. Okay. Like, go, okay. Go for it. Personal experience in terms of, like, how I feel, you're right. But I have been connected in one way or another to a bunch of people who have... Um, I love you. Does that make me gay? <laughs> <laughs> Please continue, Michael. Uh, I have been connected in one way or another to uh, mm. several people who have not fit into the gender binary by their own definitions. Yeah, mm. um, like I have had many friends who were transsexual, mm. and I don't give a shit. Yeah, it's the, like the, the human. Do what you want to do. Uh, I think that the problem that you run into in the U.S. right now is the perception, real or not that the ideology is being pushed on people that are young, that are too young to make these kind of decisions. And there was a girl that I dated years ago um, who had a daughter who was gay. I mean, like, that's really the answer. She was gay. Um and she had been from very early on. So be it. Yeah, you can tell when they're young. Um, yeah, she she rejected her first marriage proposal when she was very young. Anyway, the but the push that was that was being the push upon her was that she wasn't gay. She was actually a guy in a girl's body, and there's something needed to be done about that. And like even this girl that I was dating, who was very left wing, was like, "Eh." No, and let me <laughs> let me go ahead and clarify my stance as well. Like I absolutely believe that inalterable and un irreversible surgeries and procedures like that on minors are unethical, no matter how you stretch it. 
Um, That's a good starting point. Uh, no, I'm like no, absolutely, because those those have happened, um, and um, there's all sorts of different cosmetic surgeries that exist. I don't, I'm not a fan of them, just kind of across the board. So I'm not a great person to argue for sex change procedures or things of that nature. But I will always. Um, you look angry. <laughs> I will no, always... you didn't put ice in there, right? No, I'm not a fucking idiot. All's well. That, that, you've done it before, sir. <laughs> uh, Test. No, so... Um, <laughs> all right. Good old distraction setting in. No, Luckily, I, nobody heard that because he's like talking I'm into the sure. ether. <laughs> yeah, he's talking into the void. No, uh, the... This is going to be such a well-organized and comprehensive podcast. It's not going to be like delusional or schizophrenic at all. <laughs> no one likes structure. We like freeform. Yeah. Uh, Post the whole thing. Don't even edit it. Just. Oh, I, I, don't, I, I never do. I, just, I mean, the only thing I do is I like uh, I no, normalize no. the the uh, levels. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But no, the, the only and point... And I remove, like, weird noise. The only point I was trying to make is that the human experience is complicated. Everybody has their own journey. And I think that, uh, mm -hmm. like, trying to constrict that to something like societal gender norms, which change... Have you read Siddhartha? They change and evolve over time based on culture and sure. whatnot. Uh, no, I have not, sir. Ah, oh, you see, you have missed out. Um, That's two books you gotta give them. I guess so. Yeah. I'll it? take them. Um, Herman Hess is like a great read for anybody, but uh, Siddhartha particularly is a book that had, had a lot of impact on my life. Um, it's, it's about the uh, religious seeking. Um, the, the story is, is about a character who is trying to find his own path to God. Um, and he goes through, this is in India where there's a whole lot of options, not like America where there's like, well, you know, Protestant or Catholic or, or, uh, fundamentalist. <laughs> it's a different variation of the same thing. It is, but there's like a really, like a much broader selection. Yeah, I'll in, be, I'll be back. I'm still listening. Just speak loudly. Okay. Um, so uh, Siddhartha goes through like a lot of the very common um, sects. I'm trying to say that in a very specific way. Sects. 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 Uh. Um, okay. In India, uh, so he goes through the ascetics and the Brahmins and the like. There's a, a broad swath of religion that he goes through. Okay. Um, and at least from my perspective, the moral of the story is that you have to find your own path to God. Right? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of paths, and people can kind of point you in the right direction, but you have to find your, your journey. own way. Yeah. It's your journey. It's a personal yeah. journey to God. 100%. Right? So um, this was uh, really impactful on my life. I read it when I was like 16, 17 years old. And... Uh, and I think that, that that kind of fits into the current conversation. Though. Like, you, you got to find your own path to adulthood, to the person that you want to be in life. I, I, yeah, I agree. I, I can put myself back into the uncomfortable teenager that I was. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I actually had that conversation with him. I've got photographs. Well, yeah, okay, so, like, I remember you at Boy Scout camp with your long black hair, looking all sultry and stuff. Yeah, I wish it was still black. Oh, well. Uh, for those it's that don't know, gone. Michael's hair is white as fuck. <laughs> um, but, so, like, there was a very impactful moment in my life that happened about, like, half a mile from here. And it was between me and your brother, and it was the day we decided not to be nerds anymore. <laughs> and 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 it's it's an arbitrary choice, right? Like, we're, we're still nerds. Mm. We are what we are. It was just the outward thing yeah. we did for I, other people. I've always envied him about the decision that, like, I'm not going to be an introvert. Yeah, that we. It was like it literally happened over there where that gate is at. 
where that gate is at. Uh, yeah. If, if, so if you go past that, the the main intersection where you go, if you're going to go n- to the high school. Okay. On the left hand side, mm-hmm. there's that cow gate. He and I stopped. We ran okay. that power line. It was. It's the. Uh, I forget the word for it. Um, where the power lines run. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I used to walk home through there. Yeah, so we we, we ran all the time because we were in cross country. So, Mm -hmm. like, we came to the top of that hill, and it's like, in my mind, it's like, uh, what is that movie, The Chariots of Fire or whatever? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's like this thing where we stopped at the top of it, and we just decided, like, you know what? We're done playing D&D in front of people and playing Magic the Gathering in front of people. Aw. And uh, wearing sweatpants and shitty Mardi Gras shirts. We're going to, like, we're going to be cool dudes. And, like, uh, as much as I crap on, like, the secret, like, we did. We manifested what we chose to do. Like, we're just not going to be nerds anymore. We're not going to do it. And we still did it behind closed doors because you are who you are, right? Like, and there's nothing wrong with it. That's the, I guess mm-hmm. that's the overreaching point of it is that, like, be yeah. a nerd. Be, be, be a are. nerd, man. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Because you can be a nerd. And you can be a dad, and you can be all that stuff. It doesn't matter. Like, you can still be a tough guy, too. But anyway, yeah, so it. what was neat about it was that, like, it's literally, like, half a mile from your house. Mm-hmm. And I showed him that. So, but going back to the whole, you like... You showed him that. Okay. That's... No, we, we did. It was, a, it was a mutual thing. No, we, I want to hear the story where you showed him that. Oh, oh he's seen my wiener. <laughs> no, it's good. We're all good. We're solid. That's okay. it. No, so like uh, going back to like the, the you didn't be- listen to the podcast, so you can say whatever <laughs> you want. Being 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 a teenager, a young person, being uncomfortable in your body, mm-hmm. that's not specific to a transgender person. Yeah, that's not s- no body uh, body dysphoria like can affect people who aren't right. But why do we pretend like it is? I, there, there's I've, been a huge push specifically towards um, teenage women and transgenderism. Like, so transgenderism has always existed. We've talked about this on the podcast before. Uh, but the most common form of this kind of gender dysphoria issue is um, men who have felt out of place in their bodies from the time that they were very, very young. And this teenage girl transgenderism is is new it doesn't affect me anymore you can't do that (laughs) um it is very new and i i think it's like it's uh taking advantage of um either a homosexuality in women or just like an uncomfortableness in the body that exists among everybody, but it's been focused upon teenage girls for the last several years. Um, and there's this giant rise. Yeah, it's like 24, in, 20, it's some crazy percentage. Yeah, um, it's this giant rise in um, what they call rapid onset gender dysphoria that's new. And I, I can't help but think, and I might be wrong, I don't know everything, you know, uh, I can't help but think, but this is more of a cultural issue than a biological or a psychological issue. I've, I, I have, I, I take issue with that uh, simply because like I, I see a lot of, um, you mentioned like Ron DeSantis types, the whole like, oh, think of the children type of thing, which is an important argument to make. I think I explicitly said that I don't support this guy too, but whatever. You did. <laughs> you did. Um, but it's just the, the, they're very much the type of argument that I do. He <laughs> likes to have, um, and people of his, his foreign policy of, is terrible of his ilk. He's horrible. He's, uh, um, yeah. it, it is very much, it goes back to the same, it's not always a logical fallacy. It's not because thinking of the children is very important, but mm-hmm. it's also a scapegoat very yeah. often. Like at what point should you really be talking about sex with children? When they go through puberty. Sex and sexuality. Just before I they go probably. through puberty, that's it. 
Like this was, uh, okay, so this is a thing that exists in my life, right? So um, I went to a Baptist school in middle school in the height of the uh, AIDS epidemic. And this has definitely still affected me, right? Like, so the way that they introduced sex to us in fifth and fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I guess. Yeah, I remember fifth grade. Um, ha- has definitely impacted me in a, <clears throat> a way that has followed me throughout life. Like, there is some um, repressive sexual instincts that I still have that it's like, you know, that like there is some fear about it. Like whenever, <laughs> man, I'm my about for it, to my, reveal get it, a lot get it, here. Get it, get it, get it, girl. Um, like every time I have sex with somebody new, it bothers me for weeks. Like I worry about what may arise from that for weeks because of the the fear that they put in us about about sex what, what, which part of it though like the emotional or no 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 i'm you know i kind of worked that out in high no, no, school no, no. probably I, yeah but, okay i got you um but like just the concern about uh health issues oh yeah yeah because we're all gonna get gonorrhea and chlamydia exactly syphilis exactly so for like weeks after i have sex with somebody new i'm like i'm concerned about that like oh my god what's i remember being in what's gonna happen i remember being in school and they lied through their fucking teeth like when they told when they talked to us and they gave us sex ed where they're just like oh all of these crazy different things can can happen to you it doesn't matter if you wear a condom it doesn't matter i went to a baptist school think about that i bet it was probably much worse (laughs) i'm sure it was much worse but it's like i remember being given all of that false information and having so much paranoia Mm. well and and think about like the the truth is those seeds grow like that I cannot escape those ideas even at 47 that I am now. Like, it still affects me, um, the propaganda that they, they, that they instilled in me. And I, like, I know better. I mean, I know better in the sense that I know that these things exist, but I but know it was, they're not, like... It was in such a formative time in your life. As, yeah. Um... And so, and I I think that that's affected, uh, like several things about how I approach relationships and sex in general, um, even to this day. And because of that, that's, that's kind of where you're taking that view of like transgenderism as it relates to young people, because you're impressionable. You, well, I mean, that's part of it is that, yeah, exactly. The, the, the prevailing um social norms <laughs> the, the the prevailing social norms do have an impact on your perception of these things mm-hmm. um and that the the uh, the existence of gender dysphoria being primarily male but not exclu- exclusively and starting very early in life is age old this has existed for a long time but the, this rapid onset gender dysphoria is a new thing. I, it, it leads me to believe that it's more of a cultural issue than an actual psychiatric, psychological, or biological issue. Why do you disagree? I don't disagree with him necessarily. I do believe that there is a... Oh, there's, there's so many cultural issues that's, that, that are going on. Mm. at this present moment uh but uh the way that i see it is that um that i, I think that honestly if oh, i'm damn you took that as a sign oh, to go get me more we're gonna have to food. we're gonna have to end this before he starts saying slurs on air <laughs> we're like almost three hours in too yeah uh but no it's the way that i see it in the way that it affects me emotionally because i'm not like i'm not i'm not a straight person i think most people would consider me queer uh like what does that mean to you queer is just a big old umbrella term big old umbrella term that they use to describe anyone who's not like straight or cisgender 
is just a big old umbrella okay. term you can use for anyone who's like that. Um, and be- because of that, I, I do, I will admit, I have a lot of emotional commitment to these issues and I have had a lot of um, friends. I don't have a place to speak. Okay. Yes. I, I've, I've had a lot of friends who have fallen into those categories. So I feel a lot of anger. Uh, when it comes to certain people, politicians, uh, governmental people who, hey, if I want to... Uh, Can I ask you this? It, Between the two of us right now. <laughs> so... Uh, You're like barely on axis. So I'm barely I'm on axis. Okay. So uh, I'm trying to interrupt you and I apologize for it. So I teased you your entire life because I knew your entire life. Do you think I care? Hmm. No, because I trust you and I know you. Okay. So my question to you is, is like, I guess like as, as a parent or as a person, do you think I give a shit who you love? He's shaking his head. No, because I don't love whoever you want to love. So the, like getting back to the libertarian aspect of it, we don't care. I don't. Do you feel like uh, I wanted to? Th- I thought of this earlier, right? Did I ever teach you how to think? So this, this all right. Sorry, Go this ahead. is a very confusing point to both me and I assume the audience. Yeah. Um, are you gay? Are you bisexual? Are you like where? How do you classify yourself? I mm-hmm. guess. In uh, terms of yeah, sexuality, yeah, yeah, not yeah. just so, like so gender. To be, so to be perfectly candid, uh, I would consider myself to be bisexual. Yeah, maybe some people would see me as pan, some people would see me as whatever. What the hell does pansexual mean? I don't mean? fucking know. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it's a whole fucking rabbit hole. I could be with you here all day. Okay. Uh, I mean, we're, you know, we're almost three no, hours in. I don't have a problem no, with this. It's, uh, I say bisexual because... I live in the South, and most people understand what that means when I say that. Okay. Um, I mean, pansexual means that you're, like, into non-human. That's not exactly what it means. It's, okay. Well, okay. Please look, it, explain it, to okay, me. Okay, okay, okay. You want me to go through this? Pansexual yeah, just know, means, you, like, you, yeah. Okay. What are you, like, sheep? Okay, about? okay. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, pansexual okay. is me? sort of an umbrella... Sorry. Oh, okay. Pansexual kind of falls no, under. On you. Pa- pansexual kind of falls under the bisexual umbrella. Basically, what it means is okay. So, bisexual. What does that mean? It means that you can be attracted to both genders. Mm-hmm. Oh, so only two genders exist. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's a that's an important point, point. I think. Right? I don't know. Yeah. Just thought I'd point that out for a second there. One one, one millisecond. Like whether you identify that yourself bisexual. with one or the other, really, there's just two, right? No, I, I, you don't have to answer that. I'm listening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to. We 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 deal with one topic at a time here. Otherwise, my <laughs> fucking head's gonna explode. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, pansexual kind of falls under the umbrella. Uh, you can so. A lot of people see it different ways too, where it can be like hanging in there. Yeah, a lot. lot Like I have this um, eyelid issue where I'm like tearing all the time. Yeah, so mine twitches constantly. um, Pansexual. So you can. Not only is it like you aren't just attracted to both genders you're attracted to you can have the ability to be attracted to transgender people have the of, of either well they're of either one side. gender or the other though. yeah right. and then um and then there's also uh pansexual from what i understand leans more towards the personality you aren't yes. you are attracted to both genders in the sense that you aren't attracted so much to their body their person as you are to the, who they are as a person. That just sounds like uh, teenage confusion to I'm me, honestly. Kidding. I mean, like, no, I, I'm I'm not trying to diminish this in any way. Yeah, I no, mean, I like understand. There was a there was a time in my life where there was a real confusion about, um, like, romantic sexual 
lustful attraction like all of these th- these things I think kind of every young man goes through a phase where they're confused as to whether or not like hey like like my friends am yes. I really attracted yeah. to them Yeah 100% yeah. no I I, yeah. I did that I was like 11 12 years old and I remember like Oh, do I love this person? Like, mm-hmm. it's there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, that. Like, and is that love? Don't be like a sexual love. Yes, or exactly. Or there's entirely. nothing wrong with it. It's just that yeah. for me, that never went away. Yeah. So <laughs> for my for my son, that never went away. He yeah. just he loves everybody. I mean, like, okay, so I like I had my homosexual experience when I was younger, and what it taught me was that I'm not gay. Yeah, not gay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, okay, so this isn't. Turns out, like, I was confused, and this isn't for me. Yeah. That's fine. And Everybody's that's got their own journey. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's uh, and obviously, too, like, everybody's got different, like, uh, spectrums of it, too. Like, like some people, like, well, because when you, when you come to love someone, too, like, when you come to really care for someone, th- who they are as a person is going to make them more attractive to you mm-hmm. as well, on top of their physical yeah. attractiveness. There's yeah. gotta be you, like know, you can't just, like talk out know, there I'm, by yourself. I'm so I was trying not to like be disruptive. Part of the podcast. Just <laughs> trying not to be part of the podcast. My whole point right. to that, like, yeah, okay, so you love somebody, but th- my point is that like instead of sleeping with them first, maybe you get to know them first, so you can figure out all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, are we on the same page? Or do we have the same things? Are we the same person? Do we mm-hmm. do we have the same? chi whatever you want to call it i don't know are we going along the same path are we yeah. are we the railroad tracks headed that way yeah. well but it, it's weird what sex can do to your attraction to somebody uh too. yeah uh her name was jessica and it ruined my <laughs> life jessica. yeah you remember her <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I yeah no mean, absolutely it, like i i absolutely agree with you no like i i do think that it's it's important to See if you have chemistry first, and then you know. Like, but sex is also an important part of that. I don't think you should. Hey, I, I'm sorry, Catholic members of our of the audience, but I, I don't think that you should get married before you have sex. Absolutely not. That's that's your sex life can. Well, for you're most talking people, to the South mostly. So you're also talking to the Baptists. The Baptists. Yeah, you I'm talking to the Baptists. Not get I I I yeah, think. Set, well, I've already t- I've already told them I'm not straight either. I'm already dug my own grave. It's fine. <laughs> no, so it's you know the look, funny thing is that most of them don't care. Yeah, they do the other stuff. No, so I I think that because sex can not always, but it can be a very important part of any romantic relationship for the most part. It, it for, is an important part yeah, of any romantic relationship. It is. Uh, that's what I mean, where it's like, it's good to kind of know how that chemistry plays out before you get married. At least th- that's the way that I see it. Yeah. Before you decide that you want to spend the rest of your life with that's that person. Oh, it, there's a uh, Pacific Islander group. You know, I did anthropology. So um, there's a Pacific Islander group that uh, that readily supports um, marriage before sex, like experiment, like go with as many people as you like. But when you decide, that's it. Yeah. Um, and this is, of course, an important part of small scale societies in general because one of the most uh, socially disruptive issues. Infidelity. It. Huh? Infidelity? Infidelity. I was going to say incels, but... No, no, no. One of the most disruptive parts of a society is adultery. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, it creates a lot of hatred. <laughs> that That's really the result. So, like, they encourage you to, um, to play around, to have sex with as many people as oh. you want, to experiment and enjoy yourself sexually but once you have decided on your mate your partner that's it i'm gonna cut you off because the um where we started with this was children Mm -hmm. kids like uh, our, our 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 idea of or any everyone's idea at this table with children and how like those same ideas of uh, like it's a weird thing I have with him 
we've had this conversation where like uh I hate watching Netflix because every show I watch has like a gay thing in it, right? <laughs> yeah. It's it's like part of the the system at this point. And, and you like, have to have the um the multi-ethnic relationship yep. and the gay relationship. None of which it, yeah. would bother me, right? It's like, it's a good show, yeah. but like, why are you pushing the shit in my face? And so like, I, I've, ha- I've <laughs> so had, I've had this conversation. Have you Arcane? Yes, I have. It's a great, great show. It's fantastic, right? Lovely, like, so lovely. I started watching it again for the second time. There's multi relationships. Yep. They aren't intrusive. Gestures there my is homosexual r- relationships. Yep. yep. They are not intrusive. They're not None integral to us. the poor to the story they're not not at all they're just something that's organic as part of the story and that it doesn't really affect things like it's it's not an in your face issue like look how gay we are or yeah. look how multiculti we are or whatever so i completely agree with what greg was saying about this and do you want to know why that is it is because on one aspect of the war you feel like they're shoving it in your face on one aspect that is people trying to pander to a crowd um, insincerely. Yeah. It, it's and about in, don't tell me what I'm supposed to think. Just tell me a good story. Which, like, it makes me feel weird because I had plenty of queer people who I knew growing up who saw the most blatant pandering, lowest common denominator homosexual romances and I hated them but they liked it because it was it was their thing and they didn't see at least at that time didn't see many things that catered to them in that way but I hate that because when you make a story you should be focused on the characters Mm -hmm. and the struggles that they go through the reason why arcane specifically is so good is because the characters and their struggles are great and yeah. the fact that they might be homosexual is it it's, it's a, incidental it's a small piece of their character yeah. like the fact that there is a there is like sexual tension between Kate, caitlin and the, the, the fact that there's sexual tension between caitlin and vi in that show mm-hmm. is important to their characters the fact that they're both women is incidental right Exactly. Exactly. You you've told a oh disaster. Um, you told a story that is uh, about characters that are interesting and round and full, um, and not tried to tell a story that is intended to express some particular political or social. System. Well, because I don't, I don't mind a, I don't mind a story that's got a political message as long as you're not being insincere about it. As long as you're not trying to pander to an audience. Like I I don't appreciate it when it is injected into the story instead of a natural part of the story. That is exactly how I feel. Like I, I listen. I'm on your team, gay. Trans, whatever. I don't. I don't. I really yeah, do don't, what you I don't do. give a fuck. If you're an adult, live the life that love. you think is best for you. Do you want to hug a sheep? You want to do whatever you want. To, I, I really don't care. I honestly, like, yes. Listen, I am a troglodyte. Pig, sheep, whatever. Yeah, you know, so like, we're all. This, this episode's gonna be so fucked, dude. Oh, it's, I know. Like, I don't make any money off of this anyway. No, though. no. So, like, uh, I really listen. We, hey, you want to? I'll never meet you. I don't know you. I'll never see you. And I love you. And I don't care. I don't care if you love another <laughs> well, man, love you, another woman, another care, whatever. Right? I don't I, like. I mean, I do. I do care about your well-being as a human being, as well as you care about your well-being and care about yourself. We don't give a crap who you love. None of us. Not we do. Yeah. It, this has always been the issue with libertarianism: is that you. You choose the life that you think is best for you. And don't and let anyone I else interfere with as it. As long as you don't impose that. 100%. On me. Every day. So that that has always been my trouble with the whole, I have a kid. Both mm-hmm. you fuckers, uh, you two people don't. That's too late, man. Too We're late. already. All right, yeah. So you you, you, <laughs> well, ins- you can say whatever you want at this point. You two some bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of you have kids, and and Michael, I hope you do one day, um, at uh, like fifty seven years the, old. Fifty seven. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> you, they still work, man. 
they the still work. They still work at seven. They still work at fifty seven. Um, uh, it's it's a fun thing. It's a it's a neat thing being a parent. There's this Brazilian girl that's forty seven. Ooh, like, no, actually, she's twenty seven. Uh, I'm forty seven. You should not. No, don't do that. Uh, but so believe in traditional relationships and like. So like like anyway. I this is this is a big disagreement between him and I. <laughs> uh, he's like shaking his head and walking away. He, I don't uh, even no, I know. I need another drink. I can handle this conversation. I <laughs> so <drink>. I don't. <laughs> I don't care much for. Uh, how do I start this? This is a terrible example. I had uh, the other day. I asked my daughter. I said, "Hey, Henley, what are my pronouns?" <laughs> do you know how she answered? No. He him. Oh well, that's. Easy. No, why the fuck should she know what my her my pronouns are? Daddy. <laughs> That's it. Well, pronouns are a weird thing too because the the person that you're telling your pronouns to doesn't use them unless you're not there. But I didn't. Right. Like so, I don't refer to you as he him unless I'm referring to you when you're not around. Yeah. He did this. He did that. Otherwise, it's Greg. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. I I, I don't... <sighs> the the focus on pronouns is, is a, another one of those, like, weird distractions. It comes it comes off as closed-minded, is. right? It's it, it comes off as, like, super closed-minded. But it's like, hey, listen, like, uh, I get what you're trying to do, and that's fine. Yeah. Uh, the last girl I dated seriously had in her email her pronouns. Which was she, her, as it should be, <laughs> right? But, like, just the fact that it was there was... It's like, why do you have to specify? Like, everybody, everybody fucking knows that you're a girl. Like, why do you have to specify this? And you have to specify this because you're a psychiatrist and you're, like in that world where it matters. So that's the part I don't like about it is I don't like the compelled speech. I don't like that. Um, even, even in this podcast, right? We've had to dance around some topics. Yeah. 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 You have to like, you have to curtail your speech, but, but you don't really not on this podcast. Man. No, we I don't, don't care. Well, I, I also as like a human but being, you, you, don't do it. You feel that it's like, important somehow that you don't offend somebody yeah I, I, gotta, well that's the thing i don't want to hurt other i really don't want to hurt other people's feelings right like i don't want them to feel bad about how they are like hey we're just different mm -hmm. that's okay it's it's completely okay like you we're we're, like, we're broke you, do you but yeah we're broke <laughs> we're broken in different ways yeah that's it like i don't i don't want you to feel bad about who you are as a human being because you're beautiful mm -hmm. and I, I have been um, kind of, I don't know, derailed in some way about, like, how dating works. I, I can't imagine. I couldn't. Environment. Mm. I, I, um, I don't know what to do. Dude, um, you're a weird generation because you're like a, a you <laughs> are Gen X. I am Gen X. You are Gen X. I am a, I don't, so like. You're, you're like on the cusp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, so I identify. That sounds so gay. I lived in a world as a zenial where there was pubic hair. I I still have that. I prefer it. <laughs> Big fan. Absolutely. Yeah. Like why? <laughs> Man, are we alienating uh, some part of our audience here? It's okay. Um, They'll be here. No, exactly. We love you. Like, I don't understand why people want their girls to look like babies. Like an eight year old. Like babies. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. I don't get it. With it's, a yeast infection. It's so I, gross. <laughs> I, I'm just, not a fan. Uh, no, I'm totally either. beyond that. I lived in a world of pubic hair, and I like it. I mean, I don't want it to be the, the you know, like the, the wild it is Amazon 70s bush, here, yeah. Exactly. No, I hear you. Know, you. But yeah, 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 yeah. Like, there's some aspect of it that says, like, hey, you're mature. And the, the desire for it to be like an immature look is is really fucked up to me. I never thought about it that way. 
Like I never did. I, I don't know why you want your girl oh to my look God, like it, dude. I like never a thought about it that way. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I never, I never thought about it that it's, way. It's beyond me. And so the last couple, like serious girls in my life, have been roughly a decade younger than me. Good for you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> my wife is 10 years older than me. And I, yeah, no, you're it good. worked. Yeah. You know, so like make the trade, man. Yep. yep. Um, and I, I, uh, I don't understand that. Like there's a whole lot of like weird sex shit that has happened between my, I, Ideal life? I, like, I don't know. No, that's not the right expression. Ideal life. What do you mean? Like, what do you mean ideal life? No, th- it's just not the right expression. Oh, I it's, mean, like, I, my, my own generation. Oh, okay. And what has happened beyond that. Yeah. Right? Um. So, pubic hair is one of those things. Yep. And like I said, I don't want it to be like the wild Amazon, but I want it to exist. The Brazilian. <laughs> I, I, I guess. That's a good one. Um... But the other, like, big weird sex thing is that, like, your generation, and you're, like, on the cusp, so maybe this doesn't affect you in no, tell the me, same way. No, tell me, and tell me, we'll choose. But um, is this, like, idea that sex is supposed to be, like, really violent? Oh, no, that's me, 100%. Like, okay, so that's not my generation. Like, no, that's... So I'm... I'm probably the last generation that learned about sex from having sex. Right? So it's not like... That's um, fair. I can think like, about that objectively. Uh, yeah. Pornography didn't exist on the internet before well, me, but it was well, like it was hold, like a hold, way rarer and hold like a on a minute. harder to a- access. Hold on a minute. Okay. I'm, I'm, still of, I'm still of that generation. Mm-hmm. Right? So the difference between me and you, right... Um, you had two parents. I did. You lived in a typical, like, American household. I grew up in a single parent household. Yeah. Um, so the, the reason that I call you brother, though, is that you spent part of your time. Oh, yeah. Your parents were, you no, like, <laughs> living so, in my house. Yes, yes. There's 100%. <laughs> okay. let, let's, let's date every year because Michael and Daniel are my brothers, even though they're not my brothers. I will never not call them my brothers. And um, I do it out of a sense of duty that will live with me until the day I die to their mother and to their dad. Uh, God, God rest, God rest his soul. The best silent man I ever met in my life. (laughs) He could say so much with zero words, but yes. So like, I I, 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 I I did not I grew up so like there's like our our other friend uh his name starts with a J, his last name ends in a T. There were other people. John. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so okay. so so like I, I didn't like we had different upbringings in the same place. Like I, I didn't grow up in the same way that you or Daniel did. So I didn't He's the I, person that said <clears throat> Oh, I never think of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 so so so. There's millennials, right? There's elder elder millennials. I am. Yeah, you guys are on the cusp. You're like. I am a zenial. I am there. I know it's fucking gay. There's a, there's I hate a that lot word. Of millennial and a lot of you. You you are more X. I think my yes. brother is more. A hundred percent. Is more. Millennial. I'm closer to you than than. <laughs> you, you may as well name people on this podcast. It's just like too late. Dude. Tim. Okay, Tim. Sure. Oh, fucking! I love Tim. I, I. I love Tim. I love Tim's wife. Like they are so much fun. People yeah, but you to you want to party? Time with. I don't want to party. I need calm. Well, she quit drinking. Oh, that's true. But she's still fun. No, no, she is. Yeah, a hundred percent, she is. I, I, I love Tara. The, so. Tara is one of my favorite people out there. <laughs> my, my problem with my friends that I grew up in high school is not. It's not their problem. Mm-hmm. It's my 
It's me. I I don't blame them for any bit of isolation or or, or disassociation with me. It's it's not them. It's me. It's I I'm a uh, a family man workaholic, and uh, there's I mean it's it. I don't even know that that's X really. Um, so my generation was renowned. Like, we were well-known as the slacker generation. Yeah, but you were also the generation of telling people where to stick it. That's true. And we are also the generation of, um, of Amazon, of Microsoft. Like, well, the advent of. You, you can't claim. Sure. I, I mean, but the, like, those we, uh, we people We were the are benefactors Xers. of. Those people are Xers. Like there, there's um, the creators there's of this, yeah, like, yeah, for sure. Weird, like they're not politically engaged so much, but they're engaged. Like it, it's it's a generation of people that have pushed um, industry forward in a way that nobody else saw oh, yeah, before it's, them. It's, even though it's a generation of people that are mostly disengaged with politics, you you hear all the time the the handoff between the um, the boomers and the millennials. No, there's no handoff. We're forgotten. Yeah, like the X generation is completely lost in that <laughs> because the X generation mostly is not engaged in politics. We're just doing our own thing. I would like to. Re- uh, reiterate that I am married to a woman that is three years older than Michael. <laughs> and so I am completely cognizant of this. And you are an incredibly lucky man because she is. Hey, easy. <laughs> yeah, she looks half like she, she half, looks like she, she's, tw- she's she's on half a century and she is absolutely Looks like a twenty-year-old. I know. Gorgeous. I hundred percent agree. Just we should just don't tell her that. I don't want her to like try <laughs> to try to leave do me. Do you think she doesn't know? So <laughs> she has terrible, terrible self-confidence. So oh, to, so okay. to steer the conversation away from my mom, um, I think that a good title for this podcast would be an exceptionally long schizophrenic diatribe. That's way too long for a title. What? No, it's perfect. I was perfect. about to write it down, but then it was just way too long for a title. <laughs> it's oh, way too no. long for your brain you know, right now. Is, it's, it's, uh, no, I, I understand it. It's, it's just a, too long for a title. People don't like titles that are like eight syllables. Christmas Man. Milan. It's got like a rhythm to it, though. It's a Christmas bash. Christmas bash. Christmas bash is a way it, better it's title. It's the Christmas it's, bash, man. Like, hey, we're just here. It's less specific, though. We don't no, have to. Well, we're, pick your audience. We're not trying to talk to socialists. I don't know. I'm a. I'm a big. I just I'm, put two H's on a bash. By the way, just I, I don't know. Leave I'm, in there. I'm just a. I'm a big fucking nerd. I don't try to cater to my audience. I just am. No. Them. No. 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 Uh, no. Like, That's not true, you, friend. See, if you think that I have tried to cater to the audience, that's exactly you haven't really. Been that's listening. that's my point. <laughs> that's my point, friend. When I told you about Daniel in my conversation at that intersection. It was meant to empower you, not to tell you that I don't cater to anyone, do I? Not anymore. No. You shouldn't either. Like, it's not It's not a thing. Like, you don't do it. You're a man. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's It sounds super gay, right? It's like this homophobic thing where, like, we, we do this stuff. And... But that's the thing about Marines is that they're... Totally. Oh, we're the gayest. You, the, we're the gayest you can be next to not being gay. <laughs> next to the the village people completely ruined that for the navy. <laughs> no, the navy ruined the navy. I mean, the navy certainly didn't help, but. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's just like navy. No, it's just being uncomfortable. <laughs> it's like you don't have to. Like these are your people. The. I don't know. I I was talking with my sister-in-law the other night about um, 
like about sex, <laughs> like I'm really uncomfortable about this, honestly. Oh, um, I want to hear. Like uh, about sex in general, and um, the. So for me, I think the the sexual revolution or the freeing of sex hasn't actually been good for people. No. I um, personally, like I have had one one night stand in my life. And I am still uncomfortable about it. I've had a lot. Congratulations. I regret all of them. Yeah, so that's the thing, right? Like, And it's not like I have any kind of judgment about sex. You do what you think is best for you. But I think the promotion of the idea that just like free love, sex in general, that, that going out and finding just random partners that is that doesn't matter is positive for your sexual life i think is a problem i i you know like i said to no. to people generally like if you think that it's good for you then that's great but i think the promotion of this idea that it is somehow empowering is wrong. And I don't mean just for women. I mean for men, too. I, I can speak to this because there was a point in my life when I was a coxman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's a real word in the English dictionary. Don't make me chug this. Um, <laughs> yeah, my son is here. So I'll, I will curtail some of the rhetoric. For my own benefit. For his benefit. Um, yeah, no, so... I'm like reminiscing. So there, there are definitely, I have, I love women. Yeah. Well, well I mean, we, we, I mean, it's just like whatever. Me too. <laughs> you, I mean, you can love men, you can love whatever, but like, so for me specifically, it's been like one woman, one. And I've never felt the connection to this any other person like my soul belongs to her and 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 I wish with every ounce of my being that I could have given her that the one thing I couldn't give her couldn't get I can't give her my virginity because I'd given it to everyone else my innocence whatever you want to call it but but I do argue this point as a man I, that's a terrible conundrum. How how do you be a competent lover without experience? Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, you got Google now. Yeah, sure. I mean, like you are the uh, the porn generation. Like I, I, this has had an, a real impact on sex in a way that I'm I, not the porn generation. His sister is. <laughs> okay. I still Maybe. had to steal it no, from my like parents on their VHS. Uh, sure. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um. Like I, I really feel like I'm the last generation that learned about sex by having sex. Oh. Okay. No. 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 That, you know what? That's a fair assessment. It really is. Like it, it, it was a. It was a learned <laughs> and experience. Is completely bowing out of this conversation entirely. He's. <laughs> Oh, uh, like the expression. Why are you being I, weird, bro? God, I almost wish we were video all of a sudden. Um, you can do that. You can set up cameras and what you're not. like barely picking up. Like you, you uh, got to talk. Brandon to said microphone you could do not. that. You can set up videos if you want to do that. He's I really he he how, looks he looks super uncomfortable. I, I don't know how much that he, would help your case. Which case? Like, <laughs> any of them. This is already, like I said, a extraordinarily long schizophrenic diatribe, and I mean it because this is like... The best. This is the goofiest shit. <laughs> I'm having criticizing my podcast, man. Hey, I'm part of it. I'm <laughs> criticizing myself, sir. I'm having fun with it. I have alcohol in my body. Mm. I'm doing good. Yeah, me too. There... Okay, so... God, this is... So awkward. Um, 
No, just to, to speak your mind, sir. No, he's right. He's right. He, at, he did as have a, access to porn. At, yeah. At, as a person who has... Who's most... <laughs> Just shaking the whole table, man. Hell yeah. Um, keep going. Keep going. As a person who whose more recent experiences have been with a different generation. Oh, that's going to be hard. It's like, like sex is different. Like sex is very different. Sex is... Um, so there was like... My early experiences with sex were... Were... Um, actually like in a lot of ways more voluntary and um i just like to point out that he went to the alabama school of marijuana <laughs> and sex that's that's true um so my more recent sexual experiences with younger women have been very um Violent. I was gonna say fren- frenetic. Yeah. No, violence is the right. Violent. Word, I think like there's there's been this shift because I think. No, you're one hundred percent right. Because I think of right. porn has of pornography it has an effect on it. Has been like this situation where women actually think that they want to be choked and hit and yeah like aside aside from the people who actually want something like that like i wouldn't know anything about that but uh me either (laughs) i i so it's been different like and like i had a girl like you know i i I like what you're doing too but this is what i want like do you like this is what you want like okay, so I, I don't understand. This is this is maybe a problem with me at this point. I don't know. I, I feel I, like you're talking about like an individual thing. It's no, okay. it's not an individual thing, which is the the weird thing about it. No, it's like it across multiple individuals. Yeah, 100%. Um, is that like okay? Women that want to feel like they're being raped. In sex, like, I want to be choked, I want to be hit, I want to be, like, like, I don't understand this, because for me personally, like, I'm not comfortable with this. I, like, I don't want you to feel like you're being raped. I want to feel like you want me to be there, right? I mean... Like, you're excited to, like, be with me, the type yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. Here. Like, I don't want you to feel like you're being forced into this in any kind of way. I want you to feel like you Jesus want Christ me Christ. there. You want me there. I... Look, I... I, I, I do... Well, I'll, I'll agree with you. I think that there's a lot of porn addiction on both sides of the gender spectrum. Absolutely. Um, and that has colored a lot of people's taste in sex. There's a lot of and, people. And it's not even just like even if you take the women out of it, just the 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 men's addiction to sex has had an impact on the the requirements, the the desires, the expectations. Not a, yeah, and, and the what expectations. I, it's it's there's a very large and vocal crowd of uh in incels. Uh, people who, or even not even incels, but just people who don't get laid enough. Mm. Uh, just people <laughs> yeah, who that's like all of us, right? <laughs> really? Uh, and, and a lot of it comes from <laughs> either the most and it's not enough. a lot of a lot of people probably have that insecurity and that pressure because either of pornography or because of past partners who expect something crazy from them that they're not comfortable with. like The choking the, thing is really smooth, weird huh? to me. Like, I, I, don't I don't know, man. Don't knock it till you try it. I, uh, no, I've, I've tried it. I've, like, I've, I have done what was asked of I, me. I don't, I don't mean... I've done I mean, it, I need to shut my mouth. <laughs> I've done, I did it. There was one... Never mind. I, this, my, my wife doesn't want to hear this. <laughs> I choked a girl once in South Dakota. I don't think I'd enjoy that. She loved it. Or she thought she did it anyway. No. Like, she loved there it. There was an expectation. And I completed it. Yeah. 
Like I, I've done that. I've done the job. Yeah. Too. Like it so, not, it, there was a girl that's like, I want to be dominated. I like okay, I like I get that. I uh, like I, I. Okay, so you want to be dominated? What exactly does that mean? If you want me directing the action, cool. If you want me hurting you, like that's no, not like what I'm that. into. What? Well, like, I need to keep my mouth shut. No, no say what well. you have to say because this is a confusion to the older generation. Yeah, Clarify. We don't fucking get it. I'm not. I don't want to hurt, hurt your mom. <laughs> look, look. I don't. I don't know. Fuck her up. Look, look. Okay, as a young man, as, saying this as a man, what you don't you don't want. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's it's a problem with me internally that I I, I want a pretty lady to beat the shit out of me. <laughs> no, I I think that there's a uh, desire to be dominated by anybody who either is required by their job to be dominant or is just in general dominant. I, all because of all I, of I would like to be dominated in some degree too. Not all the time, but that's something that Can't like I, that should be a part of my sexual life. I don't know, man. Like, I'm happy to dominate, but there are times that I want to be dominated as well. I'm all I'm all about it. That's like it, my experiences have been so only. Bitch fish. But I'll I'll kill you. <laughs> no, it's. I'm right here all day every day. Uh, yeah, no. Experiences have been pretty pretty positive in that on that front. Been a lot of fun. I um, it's it's not for everyone. It's everyone. Every everyone is into what they're into, and everyone's you know like. uh, So that's the thing is that there's a level of dominance that I'm comfortable with, and there's a level of dominance that I'm not. I I don't. I don't want to be. I I don't want to be inflicting pain. I don't want to feel like I am imposing on someone what they don't want. I completely want. understand that. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah, so there's a level of it, like, like I, like I'm a guy. Like I, I, like I like to take control. I like, like there's a part of that that I, that I do no, really that, enjoy. That's... But, um, but there's a, like there's a line where it becomes uncomfortable for me where I feel like I am opposing something that is not desired. And what is not desired, I don't want to give. Even if it's even if it's explicit like this is what I want you to do, like there's a point at which that I feel like I am imposing something that is inappropriate it's it's the, the the feeling of wanting to be desired it's not wanting to force yourself on someone it's wanting right. someone to be excited to be with you i exactly. completely understand that even though i'm on that the, was well stated thank even, you even though i'm on the opposite side of the spectrum in a teeny i'm a, a teeny bit of a masochist but we're gonna just sweep that under the rug because that's a little that's a little <laughs> bit much for this podcast I'm not allowed to- I'm, is it? I, I can't oh, contribute. Yeah, yeah. I can't what contribute to this conversation. Well, it's good you're not because you're not on access. <laughs> also, <microphone>. um, <laughs> we we are like seriously late for our Christmas get together. I was texted about that like an hour ago. Fuck them. Fuck them. Okay. I ever, guess we do need to wrap no, it up no, at no, some no. point. Like, uh, no, it's a, no, it's it's good. It's good. We can do it. We, let's wrap up. Let's wrap it up. Let's 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 find a a, a final um, topic to round it this all is out. Like with. a weird place to like jump off of hey, to kind of uh, like finish no, no, no. the so what I would like podcast. To, what I would like to say is, uh, so yes, I came here with my son and my brother, and uh, don't look at me that way. No, you were like, like, hey, you're not really. No, I, like I call you my brother all the time, yep. dude. Yep. Don't feel uncomfortable about I that. I don't. Not one bit. <laughs> I don't. You do. Your mom is my mom. Your dad was my dad. And I cried about him today. Um. Mm-hmm. So I think the point of it is inspiration. So like inspirational quotes. Mm-hmm. Ah, you're full of them. You give Am them every. I, you, like, I go you give, give them every time. Thank you. Um, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'll do. I can do mine okay. first. No, go ahead. 
Okay, so... I'll try to come up with something in the meantime. <laughs> uh, fuck. Um, so my biggest thing, right, for all of those who are unaware of where they are in life and what's going on with them, uh, it, it's an abbreviated quote, obviously, but it's taken this way. Um, even though you walk through the dark, lights at the end of the tunnel. Go for it. Um, if my 23-year-old antithesis of wisdom ass was going to leave this podcast with a little bit of wisdom, don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to ruffle some feathers. Don't be afraid if there's some people out there who don't fucking like you. Because they were never going to like you anyway. It is better to be true to yourself. And it is better to... It is better to understand your own strengths and weaknesses as a person. And you will gain confidence from that in itself. And I guess all I have to add on to that is... Introspection is important. But confidence is just as important. Try to take them as as perfect as a balance as you can make. And while it may be hard, it's worth it. Okay, I'm going to read Walt Whitman. Because I've been, I've been reading uh, Leaves of Grass. Mm. Like the original. Yeah. Like the, like the first one. And he has uh, quite a bit to say about liberty, and I think he um, he captures a lot uh, that's interesting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to read this. Although at this point I'm a little drunk, so we'll see how it Just it turns bit. out. Um, he says uh, liberty is poorly served by men whose good intent is quelled from one failure or two failures or any number of failures. Or from the casual indifference of ingratitude of the people, or from the sharp show of the tushes of power, or the bringing of bear to soldiers and cannon and any penal statutes. Liberty relies upon itself, invites no one, promises nothing, sits in calmness and light, is positive and composed, and knows no discouragement. The battle rages with many a loud alarm and frequent advance and retreat. The enemy triumphs, the prison, the handcuffs, the iron necklace and anklet, the scaffold, garret, and lead balls do their work. The cause is asleep. The strong throats are choked with their own blood. The young men drop their eyelashes toward the ground when they pass each other. And is liberty gone out of that place? No, never. When liberty goes, it is not the first to go, nor the second to go, or the third to go. It waits for all the rest to go. It is the last. When the memories of old martyrs are faded utterly away, when the large names of patriots are laughed at in the public square and the, from the lips of orders, when the boys are no more christened after the same but christened after tyrants and traitors instead, when the laws of the free are grudgingly permitted and laws for informers are in blood money are sweet to the taste of the people. When I and you walk abroad among, upon the earth stung with compassion at the sight of numberless brothers answering our equal friendship and calling no man master, and when we are elated with noble joy at the sight of slaves, when the soul retires in the cool communion of the night and surveys its experience and retires in the cool communion of the night and surveys... Oh, shit. I just repeated a line. Keep going. Oh, well. All right. Um and has much ecstasy over the world indeed and put back a helpless innocent person in the gripe into the gripe of gripers or into any cruel inferiority when those in all parts of these states who could earlier easier recognize all right i'm fucking this up cuz i can't even see what i'm looking Don't at stop. at this point Don't stop um i'm trying <laughs> When character, but do not yet, when the swarms of cringerous suckers 
dough faces, lice of politics, planners of sly involutions for their own preferment to city offices or state legislatures or the judiciary of Congress or the presidency, obtain a response of love and natural deference from the people, whether the they go deference. get the offices or no. When it is better to be a bound booby and rogue in office at a high salary than the poorest free mechanic or farmer with his hat unmoved from his head and firm eyes and a candid and generous heart. Mm -hmm. And when servility by town or state or the federal government or any oppression on a large scale or small scale can be tried on without its own punishment following duly after in exact proportion against the smallest chance of escape. Or rather when all life and all the souls of men and women are discharged from any part of the earth, then only shall the instinct of liberty be discharged from that part of the earth. We love you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So, Merry Christmas. liberty always seeks its end. Like, it's inescapable. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll all understand that going into this season and those beyond. So um, now I guess I got the end, right? Like, so uh, now I do the capitalist thing. Yeah. Um, so follow us on Facebook and Twitter and iTunes and Podbean and all the places where you can find us. You can like and share, comment, subscribe. All those things help us a lot. And uh, we will be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life is short. Live free. Ciao.